Do you want to learn to create games in Unity but feel confused by C Sharp scripting? Well, in this course, I am going to cover all the basic concepts of C Sharp coding to get you to a beginner level in Unity game design. Now, this course is intended for people who have little to no experience of C Sharp scripting. It is perfect for people who have never scripted before as we look in detail at each concept of C Sharp scripting. We first cover the theory and then you get opportunities to try them out. Toward the end of the course, we put these concepts into use by creating a complete beginner level game. We cover concepts such as functions and methods, input events, variable data types, arrays, conditional statements, moving and rotating objects using code, accessing and manipulating components, physics interactions, animations, and scripting for a user interface. These are the most common things you will be doing when making beginner level games. When we have finished the theory, I will be guiding you step by step through the production of a target shooter game so that you will see how these scripting concepts work using real world examples. I guarantee that by the end of this course, you will develop new skills in coding and you will feel confident making your own games up to a beginner level. You will also have created your first Unity game. So if you want to start creating games in Unity, why not enroll today? And I look forward to seeing you in my course. Hi, welcome to this first video. In this video, we're going to download the Unity Hub. So if you just want to go onto the internet to unity.com, to their website, and then just click Get Started. From here, we can go to Student and Hobbyist, and then it's the personal free version. Just simply click get started and that will actually download the Unity Hub. Okay, but I've already got it installed. So uh, it should open up. Uh, you probably don't have anything in your projects at the moment, unless you've used Unity before. Uh, you might even see a welcome screen with um, download a project. You don't really need to do that. You can just click skip to get into this section here. The important thing is that we click on installs. Now I've already got a couple of versions installed. You might not have any, you might have a few. Uh, the version that I'm going to be using in this series is the 2021.3.0 long-term support. Feel free to use any version you like. I would definitely recommend using at least 2020 version. I wouldn't use an older one like this, like the 2019. Uh, you, you can use later versions, that's perfectly fine. You will just simply click Install Editor, the official releases, and this is the latest one at the time of recording, which is 2021.3.7. Feel free to install that, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, and then once you uh, you begin to install, it will ask you to install some modules. So I'm just going to click Add Modules. Definitely install this. Okay, that's the Microsoft Visual Studio Community 2019. This is our scripting application. It's our scripting software that we're definitely going to be using throughout this series. Okay, so you, you do need that. Um, and I'm on Windows, so make sure I've got Windows installed. If you're on Mac, make sure you've got that uh, checked. If you're on Linux, then check your Linux uh, checkboxes and click install. It may take quite a while for that to actually install. So if you just want to pause the video and install Unity. Once it's all installed and it shows up in this window, we can then go over to the projects window. We're going to click new project Make sure you've got your correct version uh, selected at the top. We're using the 3D core. You can choose the location wherever you want by clicking this folder. I'm putting mine on an external hard drive and then just give it a project name and click create project. Okay. Uh, oh, I've just close that down. <laughs> um, the project name that I've gone with is Unity Scripting. Okay. And whenever you need to go back into the project, you just click on this and it will actually open inside of Unity, um, which we can see here. I've already pre-opened this. Uh, so in the next video, we're going to take a look at this entire interface.
So here we are inside of Unity. This is our Unity interface. Uh, if you've used this, if you use Unity before, you can skip this video if you like, if, you, if you're really familiar with how this works. If you've never used Unity before, I'm going to explain what we're looking at. Okay, like any other kind of computer system, we've got our drop downs at the top. Okay, we've got a whole bunch of uh, uh, options right here at the top. Then we've got this scene view. This is our 3D scene where we can drag and drop items into our 3D world. Now to move around this, if I right click on the mouse and drag, you'll notice I can kind of pan around. Uh, if I roll with the middle uh, mouse roller button, I can zoom in or zoom out. And if I left click and drag, I can select items. Okay, uh, if I want to pan, I'm going to, the middle roller button, I'm just going to press it down and then I can move my mouse around. Okay. Um, you can also use this little gizmo on the side here. If you want to go into, let's say some kind of orthographic view, like just the X and click that and I'll go directly into that viewpoint. Uh, then if I want to come back out of there, I'll just right click and drag to go back into perspective mode again. Okay. Um, you can switch these gizmos, which we can see here, these little icons. We can switch those on or off, just using this button. We can also click here in order to make those icons bigger or smaller. Okay, so feel free to do that. Uh, and that's all we need in that window for now. Uh, anything that is actually placed in your scene is going to show up in your hierarchy here on the left. So we only have two items at the moment, a main camera and a directional light. If I click on the main camera, see over here on the right hand side, we're going to get in our inspector, all of the options that we can actually change regarding that main camera. If I click on directional light, you'll notice I'll get a whole bunch of different options. So this is context sensitive. Now when I'm not selecting any item, this is blank. Uh, down here in the bottom, we have our project window. This is effectively all the files that exist on your computer in your Unity project folder. Uh, anything that's outside of your Unity project folder is not accessible from inside Unity. So it has to sit inside the folder called Assets. Okay, anything in here can then just be dragged directly into the scene. Uh, we also have a console. We're going to be using this quite a lot. This is for debugging, for messaging, for finding errors or any kind of issues with the game. So I'll be explaining how to use that in detail shortly. And then finally, we have our game tab. Uh, this is what it's going to look like when we actually complete the game. So we're actually looking directly through the main camera. If, for example, I move the camera around, not that it's going to make much of a difference, but if I lift it up, actually it doesn't make any difference. Okay. Um, it should reflect in that view, but obviously there's nothing in our scene at the moment, so you can't really see much. Uh, any of these little tabs can actually be dragged around. So for example, if I want to see both the game and the scene together at the same time, I can just click on this and I can move it. Let's say drag it over there. I can then resize my window. So now I can see scene and game together. Okay, and then obviously I can move this around, but as I say, I can't really notice any difference there. Um, just gonna put that back on there. Under window, we also have a whole bunch of other windows that can be opened. Now we're not gonna discuss those yet, I uh, will certainly be getting around to discussing various things that are part of these. Under our panels, it will actually show you what's already open. If any of them are floating and not docked, you can close all floating panels. Under layouts, you can change the order of your layout if you want. So let's say we wanted two by three, it's gonna automatically change for us. If we want a four split, it will give you that. This is looking a little bit more like something like 3D Studio Max, a 3D editor. Um, if you want like tall, okay, feel free to go with whichever one you want and you can modify any of these. And then when you want to go back to the default, just click default and it will take you back there. 
Now those items that were in the hierarchy seem to have disappeared, but actually it's a tree view. So you just click the little arrow and it will reopen all of your items. Exactly the same as what we've got going on here in project as well. Uh, these icons that we can see down in the project, the size of these can be changed by using this slider on the bottom. So you can go to like a list view or you can have really big kind of icons. Later, we'll also be taking a look at the search functionality that we can use there in order to search through this folder. We have search functionality on pretty much everything. So we can also search the hierarchy and um, this doesn't actually have a search, I don't think. No, okay. Only on items, only on these kind of things where you've got multiple objects. Um, finally, if you do want to sign in to the Unity um, uh, application, you can just click sign in and it will automatically take you onto the net. And from here, put in your email address and your password, which is completely free. Okay, if you don't have um, if you don't have that, you can actually just use your Google or your Facebook or, or whatever you want, uh, or you can just create a free Unity ID. Uh, the benefit of actually signing in is that you can then uh, go onto the Unity Asset Store and start downloading free Unity assets or bought Unity assets as well. Okay, so that's the interface. In the next video, we'll take a look at setting up our scripting program. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is actually save a scene. Now we've already got a scenes folder and the scene that we're currently in is this sample scene. Okay, so I'm simply gonna do file, save as, uh, go into the scenes folder and I will call this uh, scripting basics. Okay, uh, you're perfectly fine to leave gaps between the words if you want. Okay, and I'll just uh, save that. And now at the top, you will see that it's saying scripting basics. So it's showing me what scene I'm currently in. I want to go to edit and then to preferences. Very importantly, I want to make sure that my external script editor is the Microsoft Visual Studio 2019. It may very well say none. It may say something else. Um, or you may be on open by file extension. It's very important that this is ticked, that this is the script editor that it's going to use. Okay, because Unity needs to link with Visual Studio. And this is the way that it does it. Once they're linked, the Visual Studio will be communicating directly with Unity and you'll get things like hints, you'll get something called IntelliSense, um, it will actually auto update inside of Unity. You'll get any kind of errors show up inside of Unity as well as in the script editor uh, because it understands how Unity works. Okay, so very important that that is placed there. Uh, everything else is good. So now we'll actually create a script. Um, so here in the project folder, I'm just going to right click, choose create a new folder. And I'll keep all of my scripts in the folder called scripts, just so it's nice and organized. And then creating the script is as easy as simply right clicking, choosing create and a new C sharp script. Okay. Uh, now when you're naming your script, make sure that you don't put any spaces in the name. Okay. Um, so I'm going to call this something like, um, I'll call it, test events. All right, notice it's all one word, capital T, capital E. So when when you're actually, um, when you've got two words together, so that it makes it easier to read, you capitalize the first letter of each of the words. Something called camel case, much like the humps on the camel's back, it makes it easier to read. Okay, and then just press enter or return. Sometimes you'll see something like these pop up. This is basically where it's compiling the script. Now, when it says compiling, it's actually taking the code that's in the script and it's converting it into um, a readable format for Unity. Okay, so I'm gonna double click 
and this will then open your Visual Studio. This is the first time that you're running Visual Studio, you will have to sign in. All right, once again, it's completely free and uh, it will open like this. Okay, it may take a while for it to open. Now, if you're seeing a completely white background with black text, um, you can go with that, that's perfectly fine. Under Tools and Options, you can actually change the theme. I'm, I'm currently using dark, okay? So I actually prefer that. It's a little easier on the eyes. So you can, from there, you can simply choose that and then click OK. Um, with any kind of a script like this, if we hold control on a keyboard and use our roller on our mouse, we can actually make the text really, really big or really, really tiny. Okay, so you can zoom in or out. So I think roughly about this size should be good. If you're on a Mac, that's obviously whatever your shortcut is for something like this. It's whatever it is. It might be Option or it might be Alt, for example. Um, but that will allow you to do the same thing. Okay, so our script. Part of it has been completed for us. We have two methods that have already been complete, uh, set up for us. So I'm just going to explain what we're looking at. All of this is our script. Anything between here and here is what's going to get executed in the uh, Unity. All of this stuff at the top is actually powering all of this in here. Um, this, for example, is start if I were just to type start, that, you know, technically Unity would be like, what What do you mean start? What? What is this? It's actually getting the definition for start from this. Okay, if I'm using Unity Engine. If, for example, I were to comment this out by using two um, green things, it's no longer using mono behavior. And if I comment all of these out so that I'm not using any of these, should technically turn these red. They should have red underlines, but for some reason it's not. Um, anytime that you see a red underline, it's basically telling you that there's an issue. There's a bit of an error happening. It doesn't understand what you want to do with this. Mono behavior is the Unity scripting. Okay, it needs to have using Unity Engine for it to understand this. So if I delete these back out, Notice everything returns back to normal and it's perfectly fine. Now our start and our update have gone to blue. Whenever you see these kind of blue elements, it means that it's recognized and that it's actually an internal element. Okay, so it's being powered by some of these internal scripts. Now, uh, this is public, which means it can be read by other scripts, okay? Uh, it can be accessed from outside of this script by another script. The class is the script itself. Okay, it's all of this. And notice that the name of the class or the name of the script is exactly the same as the name that we gave it, the file. And the dot .cs simply means C sharp. And it's deriving from mono behavior, which is the Unity engine code. All right, uh, inside of start, notice that we have these curly brackets just the same as a class does. Anything that you want to place, for example, in the start, must go in between these two curly brackets. If we place something outside, just here, that technically doesn't belong anywhere. It doesn't belong to any event, so it's not going to get called. Under the update, once again, anything that we want to run in there, we're going to place in between those curly brackets. Now, if we were, for example, to go down here and place something down here outside of these curly brackets, it's technically outside of the script. Okay, it would be completely ignored and most likely would actually return some kind of an error. So we have to be careful to make sure that everything actually goes in between these curly brackets. Now, if, for example, I accidentally delete a curly bracket, so if I use backspace, we're going to start to see that things go wrong. Okay, first of all, the update is no longer recognized. 
it's gone yet it's gone this yellow color and it's got a little green squiggle under it and this final curly bracket it's got like a red squiggle generally if you notice this it means you've got an incorrect amount of brackets all right um, at the moment the start is starting there and it's actually finishing there if you notice as I hover my mouse over there it's showing me what it's connected to so now the update is inside of there and the actual class itself is never getting closed okay so if you do notice that it's just a case of holding shift and your uh, angular bracket which will then give you your curly bracket okay and notice that everything's working fine now you can now save our script just by clicking save asset scripts test events and that's it all right so that is now going to update inside of here so what we're going to do in the next um, video is we're going to take a look at the console tab now we want to take a look at this console tab uh, this is where you display any errors or warnings or any kind of debug logs when you're working through your script. Uh, yours might actually be showing something. Uh, I, I've got three warnings. Uh, these are your three buttons, okay? One for messages, one for warnings, and one for errors. So if I actually switch on the warnings, just by clicking on it, it's going to show me uh, any kind of warnings. Okay, a lot of these are internal. Uh, if you're importing objects, it might just come up with a warning that says uh, this object has too many faces or maybe the textures are a little weird or it might say something like this. The majority of warnings can generally be ignored. If I now click this clear button, that will get rid of all those. Okay, um, this is the important one, the one on the end. Uh, this is the errors. Okay, any errors generally are associated with a script so for example if I go back and recreate that error that I did before by uh, deleting a curly bracket I now save this script let it compile I've now got an error okay it's showing me one error and it's basically saying it's expecting a closing curly bracket all right so it's going to show me and generally this is going to tell me which script it's part of test events it's even going to show me what line and what um, what character it's going to expect. It's even got an error code. So if it's an unusual error and you're not sure how to fix it, use that error code, go onto the internet, something like Google, and type that error code in, and then see if anybody else has provided any kind of solution to it. But this is actually telling me what it, what is expected. Now, if I double click on this, it should take me back to the script, to the exact line, and show me where the issue is. But obviously we know how to fix this. Once it's fixed, click save. And that error will now disappear. Okay. Um, okay, uh, got a new warning as I clicked on this and this is an internal warning. So sometimes when you're clicking on buttons in the editor, uh, it may come up with a warning, don't worry just clear that okay so what I want to do now is basically leave a message all right so whenever we want to actually write to the console we can do it this way so I'm gonna type debug with a capital D dot log and then open brackets and notice it even tells you how to actually write this so debug dot log object message Okay, where you get these little blue sections where it's saying object, that's just what it expects. It expects either you're going to access uh, an object or you're going to leave a message. Okay, and it's going to tell you that it expects it to be a string. A string is a string of characters. It's basically a bit of text, but a string always belongs in quotation marks. Okay, so if I leave a message, let's just call it message. Whatever you type in there, it will display. It's even given me a little red issue on the end. It expects a semicolon at the end of this. So if I put a semicolon. So a semicolon is a way that you can tell the scripting editor, this command is now complete. Go ahead and run it. 
Okay, um, so this is how you write to the actual console. Now if I save that, well, first of all, you'll notice I don't get any message. That's because it's dependent on it actually being run in real time. So it's dependent on it actually being simulated. So if I go back to my project and let's say on my main camera, I click and drag this test events onto the main camera. So now I can see that the script is attached. It's in the game world. I save my scene again. I'm going to go over to my game scene. I'm going to choose play focused so that it remains a small window. And I'm just going to press play. And there we go. There's our message. All right. It simply says message. Even has a little timestamp. So it'll tell you when. Uh, it was actually performed. That might be important because if you're playing through a game and you want to know exactly when that particular message or that debug actually happened, you can then use that timestamp to help you to find when it happened. Okay, um, so I can now get rid of that. That's fine. Uh, I can once again click clear and you can choose whether to clear on play, clear on build or clear on recompile. I generally have it on clear on play. Click clear. Um, the one thing to be aware of is the error pause button. If I were to leave that on and let's say as I'm playing through a game, I get an error that is a non-lethal error or an error that's not going to stop or break anything. Well, if I have that button clicked on, it's effectively going to stop the game and it's going to crash it. OK, it's used by developers when they want to know here's an error. I want everything to stop because I want to know when that got triggered. And then I want to go to the script, find out what's causing the error and get it fixed. But when you just wanted to play through something and you wanted to test it out, it can be a little bit annoying when the game kind of crashes every five seconds. So generally leave that error pause switched off until you need to use it during debug phase. Uh, the editor, I really wouldn't go into the editor options. Okay, that, that's for professionals really. Uh, we'll take a look at the collapse function a little bit later. But for now, we know that we've got messages, warnings and errors. Okay, and this is what we're going to be doing over the next sort of 10 to 15 videos, we're going to be working in the console quite closely. Now, if we go back into our script, we're going to see that we've currently got two uh, functions, also sometimes referred to as methods. Uh, some people call them methods. Some people will call them functions. They're exactly the same. OK, uh, we've got two that have been created for us. These are the two most commonly used. The start, and as it states here, is called before the first frame update. And it only runs once, right at the beginning when this script is first switched on. And then the update is called once per frame. So if your game is running at like 90 frames a second, whatever commands you put in here are going to run like 90 times a second. But there are far more uh, functions that we can use. So uh, you will find in the resources for this session uh, a text file called Order of Events. And I've just got a web link. So if you just want to copy and paste that into uh, your internet browser, uh, this is the Unity documentation that's going to explain all the different order of executions for event functions that happen during the lifetime of a script. So as we scroll down, you can see that there are lots. OK, <laughs> so we're going to start at the top. So we've got an awake as part of the initialization, initialization and then an on enable. And then as part of the editor script, there is a reset. We're going to ignore anything to do with the editor. That's uh, pretty professional pretty advanced. OK, so we're going to ignore that for now. Uh, and then initialization is the start. That's one of the two events that are in our script currently. Then what happens after that is the fixed update, part of the physics operation. So any kind of gravity or any collisions or any um, 
any kind of momentum or force that's applied to an object all happen at this stage. And as we scroll down, we've got our input events. Are we pressing the key on the keyboard? Are we pressing the left mouse button, right mouse button, etc.? And then we get our game logic. Okay, the update. Uh, so the game logic effectively is running every frame. Okay, the update is the one that's currently in the script. And then we get these various uh, yields that belong to a coroutine. We'll take a look at those later. And then we get a late update that happens toward the end of this section. And then we get any kind of rendering elements. So if there are any post rendering, such as a post processing effects, they all happen at this specific point. And maybe we've got some gizmo rendering that we're going to get into a little bit later. Any kind of GUI, which is a graphical user interface. So this is like text or images that get rendered over the 3D scene. And then we have our end of frame. If we've paused our game, anything there will run. And then finally, if we're quitting an application or we're disabling or destroying an object, it gets run there. The reason why this is important is because when you're scripting, you need to know when do I actually want my command to run? At what point do I want it running every frame? Do I only want it to run once when it begins? Do I want it to run only if one enemy runs into another enemy? Do I want it when my player shoots an enemy? So understanding when to call the actual command is extremely important. So what we're going to do here is we're going to add a few of these uh, a few of these functions to our actual script. Let's start with awake and on enable. Okay, so let's go back. So uh, the order in which you write it is not important, by the way. Um, if I were, for example, to put awake right down here, it will still be the first thing that will get called. So the way to write a method uh, or a function is exactly the same as what's going on here. First, we type void. This simply means it's not returning any data. Um, the, this is basically a little section for return types. Since there's nothing in there, it's blank. So that's that's what void means. So we've got on awake, or rather it's just awake. Uh, it should auto complete, so just press enter or return and it will actually do it for you. And this has actually made this particular method or function private, okay, which means that it cannot be accessed outside of this script. All right, then we add on enable. So let's do that. So void on enable, it's right there at the top. Just enter or return to auto complete. Make sure it does go blue. All right, if it's a yellow color or it's any other color than blue, it means that it's not being understood or accepted. It's not being powered by one of these scripts up here. Okay, let's take a look now at what else we've got. I'm not gonna use the reset. Uh, we've already got our start. Then we have our fixed update. Okay, let's do that. So void fixed update, enter or return to autocomplete. And there we go. Then um, I'm going to ignore all of these for now because these are pretty advanced topics. Uh, we're going to get into the trigger and collision shortly. And we're going to get into input events a little bit later. We've got our update. We're going to do our coroutines a little bit later. Let's run a late update. Late update. All right, and that will auto complete. Oops, not that one. Uh, scene rendering, we'll get into that later, as well as the draw gizmos. Uh, the on GUI will, uh, well, let, let's do on GUI anyway. Void on GUI, here it is at the top. Uh, ah. Okay, there we go. Sometimes it can take a while as it's compiling. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to ignore these two for now. We're not going to do an on application quit because we can't quit out of it inside of the editor. That's only once you've actually built your game. We can do an on disable and an on destroy. 
void on disable. Void on destroy. Okay, there we go. So we've got a wide variety of different functions now, all in the same script. So let's just quickly save this. And what I want to do is test when these actual functions are actually running by using a debug.log. Debug.log. And I simply want to call the name of the function. All right, so start in this case. Let's just copy this. Control and C, let's put an update. So Control and V to paste. Update, or if you prefer, you can use edit and uh, copy and paste, or use your shortcuts on your computer. Then we have our awake. Just change this to awake so that we can see when it's running. We have an on enable. Okay, so I'm going to go through all of these and update them, uh, but I'm going to leave that as a bit of a challenge for you. Okay, quite an easy challenge to start with. It's just pasting those in and just changing the name inside the string reference to uh, the name of these functions. If you just want to complete that by the next video. Okay, so you should now have all of those completed. So what we're going to do, we're going to find out exactly how often these are running. Uh, so the script is already attached to the main camera, just make sure that's actually on there. Uh, we're going to watch our console and what we're really interested in is our messages. So I'm just going to switch off uh, warnings and errors. So we're only interested in messages. So if I now press play, just watch this, check, check all of that out that's happening there. Now if I click collapse, what this is going to do, it's actually going to collapse them all into their same kind of categories. So we can see that awake run once, that was the first one to run, then the on enable one, then the start one. The fixed update is running at this time, it's almost 10% lower than the fixed, uh, than the update, which is interesting. Uh, the update is constantly running, we can see that. The late update is pretty much exactly the same as this. It's just behind by like one frame. Uh, and then the on GUI is all the way down here. This is interesting. This is running way faster than the update. Okay, update is about 25,000 at the moment. That one's 51,000. So that's pretty interesting. So it's showing us exactly how often this is running. Now, if I click the stats button up here, it's going to show me my frames per second. It's currently running about 460 frames per second, which is why I'm getting such a high amount going on here. Now, this is only a rough approximation of the frames per second. It's not 100% accurate. Okay, but generally when you're doing messages, these are far more accurate. So, so far I've had like 42,000 updates happen in the time that I've just been speaking. Um, I've got another ongoing there because obviously I updated the stats while the stats were actually switched on. I had eight of those appear, which is interesting. But notice the start on enable and awake have not changed. All right, so I'm just going to press play. I'm just going to clear that again. So let's take a look at what did run. So we had uh, start, we had update, we had awake. We had on enable, fixed update, late update, and on GUI. What we didn't see was the on disable or on destroy. Okay, so let's get those to run. So once again, I'm just going to press play. It's going to start to show all of these again. Now to see the on disable, what I would have to do is actually switch this item off. So if I click off, no cameras rendering, but now notice that I've got my on disable run once there. So that's effectively when you switch something off. Now I could switch my main camera back on and just switch the script off. Once again, I'm going to get an on disable. But you'll also notice when I switch the item back on, I got a new on enable. Got one there and one further down. What I don't get is a new awake and I don't get a new start. So on enable will run every time it gets switched back on. 
on disable will run every time it gets switched off. If I click this again, notice on enable is now running twice, on disable was twice. Now if I choose to delete the main camera, so press delete, I now get an on destroy. Okay, so when the object gets destroyed, that particular event or method actually gets called. Now, if I press play, I'll get my main camera back and everything is good. So now that we know how often these are running, um, try to think what would be the best function to run something like setting player's health to 100 to initialize the player's health. Which particular function would you want to run that in? So just take a second to think about that. If you said start, that would be good. All right, because you're initializing it right at the beginning. If you said awake or on enable, uh, awake is good, on enable is not. Okay, awake is good because it only runs once right at the beginning of the game. On enable, however, can be switched on or off. Now, if it gets switched back on again, and let's say your player's taken like 50 damage, you don't want it resetting back to 100 when that script gets switched back on again. Okay, so you effectively only want to set something like health to 100 on uh, one of these functions that only ever gets called in one frame. And you definitely don't want to run it in something like an update or a fixed update because these are updating every frame. It means that as you're taking damage, you're always going to have 100 health. So knowing when to set a particular command on what kind of function is extremely important. And in the next video, I'm going to be setting you a challenge uh, in, in that particular respect. We now want to take a look at the fixed time update. So, or the fixed update. Um, in our example of our execution order, we can see our fixed update here, and it takes place in the physics cycle. Okay, the physics cycle effectively tries to simulate real world physics, and it generally tries to keep this particular update separate from the later update, which is just here, in, as part of the game logic. The two are happening separately which is why we saw the fixed update happening a lot slower than the actual update itself. Uh, the fixed update generally always runs the same on every computer. So even if you've got a slower computer, uh, it will run exactly the same as on a quicker computer. All right, whereas something like the update in the game logic is frame dependent. So if you've got a really, really high frame rate on a really new computer, it's going to run a lot faster than an older computer that doesn't get as good a frame rate. So let's take a look at the fixed update uh, and where it's getting its time from. So if we go to edit and project settings, all right, this, these are all the settings that we can change in our project, one of which is time. So if you click on this, this is where the fixed update is getting its time from. So a frame rate independent interval that dictates when physics calculations and fixed, up event, uh, fixed update events are performed. At the moment, they're being performed every 0.02 seconds, but you can change that if you want. So for example, if I make it even faster, 0.02, let's say, I'll just type that in, and we go over to our console and we check again. So I'm just going to press play. Wait for that to start running. Ah, okay, I'm in I'm in my sample scene. <laughs> okay. Uh, scenes, let me go over to my scripting basics. Make sure I've got my test events. Just double check that my project settings are still the same, 0 0.002. And now let's test it. Okay, uh, now we can see our fixed update is almost the same as our update. Check it out. They're practically the same speed. 
Okay, let's once again go into project settings and let's add another zero. Okay, so this is pretty intense now. It's going to be running at an extremely high rate. Uh, hopefully it doesn't crash. Let's find out. Now take a look. The fixed update is way, way faster than the update. Okay, so you can actually control how quickly the fixed update happens. Now, I certainly would not recommend having the fixed update run that fast, generally because it's trying to run physics, which is very, uh, a very complex subject. Physics requires a lot of calculations, and that is why the fixed update generally does run a lot slower than the update. Uh, to give the computer time to make all those calculations. Um, only if you've got an extremely, extremely fast computer and there's a reason to make the fixed update extremely fast, would you go uh, that fast. Okay, so um, let's go back into project settings and just remove those two extra zeros. So we'll put it back to where it started, 0 0.02. We can also change time scale if we wanted. So for example, uh, if I set time to something like 0 0.5, time is now halved. So it will be running at half time, uh, almost like slow motion effect. Let's see if it will update these values. Okay, so notice now that the update is running a, a bit slower than it was before. Let's try changing uh, time to something really, really low, like 0 0.01, for example, on the time scale. Okay, the update. Oh, actually, the update is not really affected that much, but check out the fixed update. That is definitely affected. Now it's six, seven, eight, so it's into single digits at the moment. So that is time dependent, whereas it looks like part of the update and the ongoing are not being that affected by changing time. All right, so basically experiment, try these things out. If I set time back to one, time scale of one, it's back to real time again. And now we can see everything happening a lot faster. Yeah, so the update, late update and ongoing were not affected whatsoever by time, but the fixed update was, okay? Um, so what if we're not happy with any of these uh, actual functions? What if we wanted to say, we wanted the function to run every three seconds instead? Well, we can actually create our own functions uh, and we can do so by using an invoke. Okay, so let's say in the start, because we know that that only ever happens once, if we use the keyword of invoke, and invoke basically invokes the method name in time seconds. So the method name is gonna be basically a new function or method, okay? It has to be in string quotations. So let's say, I'll call it my function. And then afterwards, it's going to require some kind of time. So let's say three seconds. Now I need to write this my function for this to work. So I'll just put it underneath here so that we can clearly see this. So void my function, and it needs to be spelled exactly the same and it's not going to return any values. We're going to notice that this one turns yellow. Basically means that it is being called by something in the script, but it's not being powered by any of these external scripts. Okay, because it's not turned blue. So this is our own custom function. So now I can do a debug.log, we'll call it uh, my function. Let's just call it that. So we'll see when that happens. It should happen after three seconds. So let's save that. Press play again. Okay, there we go. My function at the bottom there, run once. Notice it happened after three seconds. All right, excellent. If we were to change time, 
So if we were to make it half time, uh, it would obviously take six seconds before that runs. Okay, so it is second dependent. Now, what if we wanted it to run more than once? Well, we could use an invoke repeat, which basically is very much like an update. We want it to constantly be repeating, but we need to tell it how often to repeat. So let's say three. Okay. Um, oh, it doesn't like this. Wait a second. Let me just rewrite it all over again. So invoke, ah, it's invoke repeating, not repeat. Okay. So yep, my function is lowercase m. Let's say we want it first of all to happen at three seconds and then we want the repeat rate is going to be every three seconds. So we've effectively created an update, but we can dictate exactly how often it's updating. So let's save that. Let's try it again now. So if press play, we'll get my function. There we go. Once, another three seconds, two, another three seconds, three. There we go. And it will just keep doing that all the time. And there's no limit on what you can do there. If, for example, I wanted it to begin almost immediately, let's say 0 0.1 of a second, and I have to put an F on there because it's a floating point number. And then I want it to run every 0 0.1 seconds afterwards. I can do that too. So now we can see it, my function, check it out how fast it's going. All right, so we have complete control over that. Uh, something very similar to this is the coroutines or the yields. Okay, so if we scroll down to our game logic, we've got these coroutines that are basically yields. Okay, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, and one there, five. So we've got five different types of yields, I believe. So in the next video, we're going to take a look at that way coroutine works. Oh, we've even got one up there. We've got a six. We've got a yield weight for fixed update. Okay, so we'll take a look at those in the next video. Now we want to take a look at the yield command, which is part of a coroutine. So this actually runs as part of the game logic. We can see it all happening uh, here in this middle bit here. Um, so a coroutine is effectively a routine that runs alongside another routine. So, and so it's called a co-routine, all right? They're running together, um, but it requires some kind of a yield, which is a delay in when it actually runs its commands. So, uh, for example, if we call it from the update, we're gonna say the coroutine is gonna wait three seconds and then it's gonna run its command. So while it's waiting that three seconds, it's going to yield its time back to the update to let the update do its thing for three seconds. And then it wants the time back so that it can then run its command. And so they're running together. Um, it may very well be that it wants to wait until the end of frame. So it will wait for everything else to run before it takes control again and uh, runs its command or it may want to wait for the fixed update to update and then it will run its command so a coroutine is effectively a way to add a bit of a pause in your script let's take a look at how this works so the invoke repeating that we used before although it's great it's not part of the internal system so um, the coroutines can actually be part of the internal system and it can be listening to the internal system and know exactly when it should fire. When you're using an invoke repeating, you're kind of guessing as to when you need it to work. So um, let's just get rid of this invoke repeating for the moment because we, we've discussed how that works. So let's maybe start with the start. So this means that we're effectively gonna run something in the start. So we're going to start 
a curity. Open and close brackets, and what it needs as part of an I enumerator is some kind of a routine. So we'll give it its own unique name. Let's call it a uh, test routine. And you'll open and close brackets. So that basically means that this recognizes that it's a function. Whenever you open close brackets after a name, it recognizes it as a function. Semicolon in the end. It's telling me that this does not yet exist because I've not written it. So I'm going to scroll down right down to the bottom of the script. But make sure you're still inside of this curly bracket for the class. So the way that we write a, a coroutine is we write I enumerator. It's part of that group. And then we give it that exact name that we had before, test routine. And it's not going to return any data, so just open and close brackets with no data in between. Now, still got a red squiggle because it's saying that not all code paths return a value. If we write an I enumerator, we also need to give it some kind of a yield statement. So if we say yield return, notice that red squiggle has now disappeared. And let's first of all just have it wait so many seconds. So we'll say a new wait for second and notice we've got various options coming up uh, let's do wait for seconds so i'll just double click open brackets and let's say we wait uh, exactly two seconds and then we'll do a debug dot log so we'll call this um coroutine Okay, so let's just save that. So that's effectively going to get called from the start. It's going to yield its time back to all these functions that run for, for exactly two seconds, and then it's going to run this uh, message. So let's try that. There we go, Coroutine ran exactly two seconds afterwards, and it only runs once right there. So it's a way that you can add some kind of a delay. Now let's uh, try one of the other ones. So let's say yield return new, wait for, let's say wait for the end of frame. Oh. Let's just put those in there. So now it will be running um, almost immediately actually because the frame rates are extremely fast um, so we should see it happen almost immediately but that means if we're waiting for the end of frame what we're effectively doing is we're running this one okay this particular event so everything else has already run by that point there we go coroutine straight away almost immediately but notice where it's being created after everything else so if you were dependent on something happening in one of the other methods or functions and you wanted the coroutine to do something after that you could do wait till end of frame Let's see what else we've got wait for a fixed update okay we can do that one as well So that will run a little bit slower. Once again, it will be almost immediate. But let's just see when this runs. Now notice, our coroutine is now up here. Instead of it being right down at the very bottom, like it was before, it's now running just after the fixed update. So you can control exactly when that's happening. Uh, we can also call a routine, a coroutine, even from something like update, awake, unenable. So if I take this command to start the coroutine, just do, uh, I'm just going to cut it, so control and X, put it in the update, control and V. Now I'm not entirely sure what this is going to do because we're technically waiting for the fixed update, but yet we're running the command in the update itself. But let's see what happens.
Okay, late update, Coroutine, there we go. Notice it's running almost in sync with the late update. So if we had a command in the late update that said, um, we're gonna update the health after everything else has happened, and then as part of the coroutine, we wanna do something with that new health value, it would be important for us to wait until the late update has finished doing its stuff before we actually run those commands. So that's a way that we can control the order in which commands are getting run. So coroutines are extremely powerful and we'll certainly be seeing how they work in more detail by using actual projects and we'll be testing them out a little bit later. So now we're going to take a look at the physics. Um, this particular section we're going to look at the on trigger enter, on collision enter. Okay, that are handled as part of physics. Physics in itself is quite complex. All right, so there's a lot of uh, internal scripts that handle uh, real world physics in, in a really kind of precise way. Uh, so I'm going to show you how to enable that in Unity. Okay, so for this, I actually need some physical objects. So in the scene view, I'm just going to go to game object, 3D object and create a plane. Okay, that's just going to create us this big kind of plane on the ground here. Just need to make sure that this plane, uh, which currently has a mesh collider, um, also has a rigid body component. So if I click add component and type rigid in there, use this rigid body component. Uh, the rigid body is the thing that's handling all the physics. All right, it has all the scripts, it has all the complexity. This is how you enable physics inside of Unity. Uh, in the moment, it's a real physical object that could potentially use gravity, it could fall, and uh, it's got nothing to land against, so it would just fall forever. If I, for example, choose is kinematic, it will then not use gravity. It will be kind of suspended in space and it won't move. So that's definitely all I want to do there. Okay, then I want to go to game object, 3D object and cube. So I'll add a new cube. Uh, I'll just move this above the ground so that I can see it. In fact, I'll move it way up here. Uh, it's got a box collider. So if I switch off the mesh renderer, we can now see that box collider in green. All right, that's the actual physical barriers of this cube that will prevent it from falling through this plane. Switch back on my mesh renderer. Make sure that this is a physical collider, not a trigger collider. Uh, it also needs a rigid body component. And the first thing that we're gonna take a look at is the on collision. Okay, now for an on collision to work, at least one of the rigid body objects needs to be non-kinematic. So in other words, this needs to be unchecked. So this one's going to have gravity, it's going to fall, and we're going to get a message when it hits the plane beneath. Okay, so let's actually write our script. So I'm going to go into scripts, I'm going to right click, choose create, new C sharp script, and I will call this, uh, I'll call it physics events. All right, if you've got um, Visual Studio open, when, they, when you create a new script, it will automatically open this to the last script you were working on. Just uh, minimize it and then double click to open your new script. Okay, so for this, I don't need start or update. So I can just get rid of those. Um, so I'm gonna type void on collision enter. And we've got a collision enter for 3D and also a collision enter for 2D. So if you're making a 2D game, make sure you use the 2D. They, they work very differently. So if you press enter or return, it will auto complete. And it's going to basically detect any kind of a collision that happens and store it in this variable. We'll take a look at that later. So when this happens, I basically want it to return a message. Debug.log, and I'll call this collided. Okay, I'm just going to save that. And the script needs to be added to the object that has the um, rigid body that's non-kinematic. So let's just drag this onto here. 
and actually on my main camera because I've already got this script I'm going to right click and remove that component so that we don't get any kind of interference so now in my console if I just move over to game so that we can see this happening when this cube hits this plane we should see a message that comes up that says collided there we go all right collided so notice how useful that could be in, in the game, if you're wanting to detect when something happens, when an object hits another object, you can then run a command at that specific point in time. That's the on collision. Now let's see what else we can do with on collision. So if I just remove this part and type on collision will it auto complete it won't okay so let me just move this down here so let me do void on that no, still won't okay so i'll have to remove this all together to get it to auto complete all right now we will void on collision enter okay so we've actually got on collision exit this is if the object suddenly begins to bounce or move, let's say, it will then trigger that. We also get an on collision stay. Now this is similar to an update. It's gonna run literally every frame as long as two objects are touching each other. So let's uh, do both of these. Debug.log, uh, let's say, collided now let's just copy this control and C control and V control and V to paste notice I'll go red because you can only have one of these at a time so then I want a collision exit and I'm going to say uh, I'll call this bounce actually and then as as long as it's on collision stay so as long as they're hitting each other, I'm going to just change this to stay. OK, so we've got three different uh, functions there that are going on to do with collisions. Now, at the moment, the cube is just basically going to fall to the ground and not move. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the cube. I'm actually going to give it a new physics material that's going to cause it to bounce. Now we need to create this, uh, so I'll go into Assets, right click, choose Create, New Folder, call this Physics Materials, All right, keep it nice and organized. Now in here if I right click, choose Create, We've got a whole bunch of stuff that we can use, uh, the one that I want is a Physics Material, okay so let me find this wherever it is. Um, physics material there we go could barely see anything um, okay and this is going to be a bouncy material so in here once we've created this notice that we've got a bunch of overrides we've got a dynamic friction static friction a bounciness friction combined so you can mess around with these values in order to give each of your objects a real physical presence so that it acts like an actual physical object whether it acts like a, a block of ice or maybe it acts like a bouncy ball or maybe it acts like a, a 10 ton weight that definitely is not going to move okay so for this i want it to be extremely bouncy so i'm going to set that to one these are generally values between zero and one okay static friction dynamic friction is fine so this should now be extremely bouncy uh, so on my cube I can now take this material and I can drag it into that material slot right there. So this is now a bouncy material. So let's see what happens now with our commands. Okay, notice how it's bouncing. So I got collided three times, stay happened over 16 frames and bounce, it, it actually bounced twice. Okay, let's now maybe reposition this cube 
even going to go to the rotate and rotate on the red so that it's at an angle. I'm going to take this plane and make this plane a lot bigger. So just using this little white box in the middle, I'm just going to click and drag, left click and drag, so that it's huge. There we go. Uh, and on the cube itself, I'm going to make the mass just a little bit lighter. So about 0 0.5. I'm also going to reduce the angular drag as well, down to like 0 0.01. Actually on my bounciness, I'm even going to take my dynamic friction, make that 0 0.1, static friction 0 0.1, so that it has almost no friction. It should be extremely bouncy now. Now let's test it. So it comes down, it really bounces, it's going all over the place. And we've got collided happened seven times, stay happened over 66 times, bounce, it actually bounced six times this, this time. So notice how you can actually now control when commands actually run. So if something bounces off something else, you can then run commands at that specific time. All right, and that's pretty useful. So um, that is the on collision. In the next video, we'll take a look at the on trigger. Now we want to move over to um, the on trigger enter. Okay, and take a look at the difference between a collision and a trigger. Um, so if, for example, I click on the plane, all right, it's got a mesh collider. But if I click on, on the cube, you can you notice that it's got a physical collider, but there is a checkbox for trigger. Okay, as soon as I make that a trigger, uh, effectively that is no longer a physical collider. It's now uh, a non-physical collider that basically can be triggered and it can send a message to a script. But what we're going to notice if, for example, we play this, is that the cube is just going to fall straight through the ground. Okay, because there is no physical collision happening. Notice also that I didn't get any messages happening there because technically there has been no collision. A collision only occurs when you have two uh, colliders that are both physical colliders. Okay, so let's set this as a trigger and the rigid body, I am actually gonna make this one kinematic which means that it's not going to be, it's not going to fall physically. I'm going to have to manually control this. So I'm going to take my game tab and just move it over this side so that I can see the world at the same time as uh, the scene. And my cube, I'm just going to kind of put this back to normal like this. So that when, when I move it, I can just drag it straight down. In fact, let me just bring it into scene view so that I can clearly see that there we go that's better all right now i can see what what's going on there um so instead of on collision enter we now need on trigger enter and we also have an on trigger exit and an on trigger stay exactly the same so um let me just actually keep those debugs but i'll just get rid of these Okay, so don't worry about the fact that they've gone red. In fact, actually, if they're red, I, I can't auto-complete. So let's do void on trigger enter. And once again, you've got a 3D trigger enter and a 2D. Enter or return to auto-complete. And this time it's slightly different. It's saying collider other. Okay, now I can do a debug.log. And this is, uh, I'll call it trigger for when it actually triggers. I'm just going to copy this, control and C, control and V, control and V. And then I want an on trigger exit. So I'll say just exit right here. And then uh, an on trigger stay. Once again, I'm just going to have a debug.log of stay. Okay, and let's save that. 
and obviously that script is on the cube it has to be on the object with the actual collider that is a trigger that's going to be um, sending the messages so now in our console if I press play so nothing happens yet but as I manually move this cube down toward the ground take a look now I've got a trigger and I've got to stay as long as that is actually touching the other object that's going to continuously update as soon as I leave I get an exit and the stay is no longer doing anything so the actual trigger event happens a little bit like an actual collider the main difference is that you can have two objects hitting each other without an actual physical collision happening it can be a trigger collision all right and it's, this is extremely powerful and used very very often in many types of games in order to control when an event has taken place imagine for example in a car game where a car hits a barrier you want to know exactly when it happens you can easily use a trigger to do that or a collider okay you can either use on collision enter or on trigger enter okay um, so that pretty much wraps up the physics so what we're going to move on to in the next video are our actual input events now we want to take a look at input events starting with the on mouse so something like on mouse down on mouse drag on mouse up etc on mouse over and um, so what we effectively want to do inside of the game view whenever we're moving our mouse over an object let's say this cube um, we're going to display some sort of a message okay so for this I'm going to write a new script so let's go into scripts right click create C sharp script and I'll call this uh, input events wait for that to update double click here we go all right new script um, now obviously this happens just before the update but just after the physics okay uh, and what I want to do here with my cube is I actually want to remove this physics event script okay we're, we're testing something else out now I'm going to drag my game tab back over here so that I get a full screen okay so once again I'm not interested in the start or an update so if I type void on mouse okay so we've got a whole bunch of stuff that we can use here so on mouse down is when you press a button most likely it's going to be the left button on mouse drag when you press left mouse button and, and kind of drag your mouse on mouse enter when you enter the space of the object on mouse exit when you exit the space on mouse over as long as the mouse is actually over the object it will keep running on mouse up you're releasing one of the buttons on your mouse on mouse up as button now not entirely sure about that one but we'll take a look at that shortly let's do on mouse over to begin with double click on this so wait for that to go blue in a second private void on mouse over input events nope okay it's going to stay yellow okay that's interesting uh, let me just have a look yep okay uh, let's do a debug.log let's say we'll just do this as over there we go it finally turned blue <laughs> okay it's just taking it a very very long time to update that um, so yeah we just got private void on mouse over um, so on the cube I'm gonna drag the input events very importantly if you want to detect is the mouse over this object the script needs to be on the object you want to detect so in the console let's now click play as long as my mouse is over here I'm not getting any messages as soon as my mouse enters now I've got the over and take a look it's constantly running every frame that it's over as soon as I leave nothing okay it ends all right so that could be useful for like a point and click type game or some game where you need to basically click on the button or you click on an item you can now detect that 
Let's have a look at on mouse down. Okay, so it's just on mouse down with a capital D. That means as long as I click, I'll leave it as over, that's fine. Once again, nothing, even when my mouse enters, nothing. But as soon as I click, there we go, I get that one, two, three, four, etc. Every time I click, if I click out here, I get nothing, only when I'm over the object. Remember that the cube will need some kind of a box collider so that it can detect that it is actually working. It may also need a rigid body as well in order to detect some kind of physics. What about on mouse up? So this should be when I actually release the mouse button. It works very similar to on mouse down, but very subtle difference here. Okay, once again, I'm gonna press, hold, release. Okay, as soon as I release that button, that's when it happens. Now, obviously, if I want on mouse drag, This is almost going to happen like a, an update, almost, but as long as I'm dragging. Now, it's not going to allow me to drag the object yet. We can do that later. But for now, as long as I'm dragging, notice how that's updating. But as soon as I stop dragging, that ends. Okay. And then there was something else, wasn't there? So let me try void on mouse up as button. Let's find out what that is. On mouse up as button is only called when the mouse is released over the same GUI element or collider as it was pressed. Okay, so it's very similar to as mouse up. Let's make sure it works. Debug.log, I'll call it up. Okay, very similar to on mouse up, almost identical to on mouse up in fact. Um, let's take a look at on mouse um, enter. So I'll call it enter. Now remember that we had an on mouse over. So let's have a look at the difference between on mouse enter and on mouse over. So if I save this. As soon as I enter, I only get one update. Remember that the over was, it was happening every frame that I was actually over the object. So this can happen just once. On mouse exit will do exactly the same thing, but when you exit the object, it will then update. All right, so pretty interesting, pretty useful kind of stuff. Um, now, what if we wanted some kind of an input, but not a mouse input? Okay, and what if we wanted some kind of an input to happen and we weren't actually hovering our mouse over the object? So for this, um, we can script uh, inputs ourselves. All right, so let's take, let's get rid of this. And we are actually gonna have an update now. So void update, enter or return to autocomplete. So for this, we need to be checking if we are pressing something. So we're gonna use our if statement, okay? Open brackets, and we're gonna say input. Now, if I press dot, uh, we could do something like, for example, any key. Are we pressing any key? And as long as we are pressing and holding it, the command will continue to run all the time. Or any key down, that will only happen once. Let's do that. Let's double click any key down and let's do debug.log. Let's call this key. Let's do save. Now if I press play, notice my mouse is nowhere near the object. I press any key. And there we go. Okay, I pressed an O. If I press a D or a space, it doesn't matter. Each time it's going to go up. I don't need to be over the object. It's basically going to completely detect absolutely any key. 
what if I wanted to detect a specific key? So I can say input dot get, and we've got a whole bunch of stuff. One of them is key. Okay, so if I say get key, um, that's going to run every frame. So it's going to run hundreds of times a second. If I say get key down, it's going to run once when I press the key down. Get key up, it's only going to run once when I release that key. So let's do get key down. It's not complete yet. I need to open and close another set of brackets, an internal set. And what it's now expecting, and it's going to show me if I hover over here, it's expecting the key code with the actual key itself. So key code. And if I press dot, it's actually going to show me all the different keys that I can have. These are all the keys that belong to your keyboard. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of stuff, even joystick buttons, etc. You've got a ton of stuff that you can listen for. Let's just say that when I press the M key, so if I press, uh, it's, it has to be capital, by the way. So let's just say that whenever I press M, it will say key. In fact, I'll change that to M so that we know that we've pressed it. Let's do save. Now we're going to press play. If I press any key, nothing happens, but as soon as I press M, there we go. Okay, it's now detecting that specific input. And if you want to see a list of all of your key codes, uh, just go to help scripting reference. Let's type in here key code. Okay, and then click on key code. And this is going to give you a huge list of all the different types of key codes that you can use. And it's also going to explain what they are. So the numeric keypad, and which is your, um, it's almost like a calculator on the right hand side of you, your keyboard. And then you've also got the alpha numeric as well, which is further down here, alpha. Okay, that's at the top of your keyboard. You've got your function keys, you've got your various other keys, and then any of these and let's say you want to know how do I put how do I use the comma key so you click on it and there we go key code dot comma so let's try that so key code dot comma save and in fact let's change this so it's no longer M it will now say comma instead so we know that we've got it correct So press any key, even if I press M, nothing, but as soon as I press comma, there we go. Okay, so we get it running. Excellent. Now we can also listen for mouse inputs in the same way that we listen for keyboard inputs. So if we go into the script, um, instead of input get key down, we can say get mouse um, button. Uh, well, actually, let me let me auto complete. If input dot get mouse. There we go. Get mouse button. Get mouse button down. Get mouse button up. Okay, so get mouse button is basically going to run every frame as long as you're holding the mouse button down. Uh, get mouse button down is going to run once when you press it. Get mouse button up is going to run once when you release it. Let's just do this. And then what it expects inside brackets, which button, which mouse button. So if it's left, that's going to be zero. If it's right, that's going to be one. And if it's the middle mouse button, that's going to be two. So let's just do zero. For the left mouse button. Let's do a debug dot log mouse zero down. Let's just call it that. And we'll listen for that um, message in the console. So let's just uh, press play. Now previously 
with the function that listens for the mouse, you will have to click on the actual cube. I can click anywhere and it's going to show me that get mouse down. OK, so that can be useful if you're listening for any kind of an input, but it's not specifically tied to a certain object. Let's do the get mouse button. So we're not going to do down. OK. Let's do a save. And now we'll watch the number over here. So as long as I'm holding it down, check it out. It's just constantly going up. As soon as I release, it stops. OK, start again. And it's just constantly. So over 2,923 times over that short period. OK, so that's uh, the mouse button. We also have an option of calling buttons as well. Uh, the buttons are defined in the Edit, Project Settings and in the Input Manager. So if we go to the Input Manager, Axes, we've got all of these various buttons and each one has a specific name. So for example, Fire 1, the name of it, you would actually call that in script and it's, it's mapped to the left control and also the mouse zero, so that's left mouse button. Uh, you can also put in extra keys if you want. So for example, that's the positive button left control. What if I now also said right control? I can do that. So you can have multiple uh, keys all tied together to this specific button. Okay. If I also want maybe an alt negative button, I could also add maybe an O. Now, if it disappears, it's because it's capital, so I just have to put it in lowercase o. Press enter or return. As long as it doesn't disappear, you know that that's correct. OK, so let's call this fire one button. Just I'll get it to auto complete again so that I can explain it. So if input dot get button. All right, so now we've got get button, get button down, get button up. Exactly the same as the mouse button, but this time it's going to need a string and a button name. Okay, that's the fire one. So if it's a string, it's obviously going to go in quotation marks. So let's do get button down. So it's only going to run once, and the button we want is called fire one. Okay, very importantly, it needs to be spelled exactly the same as. Um, as what it appears here. So if it's got a capital F, it needs a capital F, okay? If it's called Fire One uh, A, it needs to be spelled exactly like that, okay? Which it is right there. And let's do a debug.log, okay? And I'll call it Fire One, something like that, so that I know that's the correct uh, button that I'm pressing. So once again, we can play. Um, now, if I try pressing any button, I get nothing. If I left click, I'm going to get it once. If I press left control, I'm going to get it twice. If I press right control, I'm going to get it again. And if I press O, I'm going to get it again. OK, so it's, it's the same button, but it's now tied to multiple keys on your keyboard, which is really useful. Now, if we also take a look at the input manager, we can also see a little bit further down that we've got a duplicate fire one. So let's take a look at this one. This one's actually linked to a joystick button. So if you've got like a joypad or something or a game controller, you can actually use these same names to link these to the buttons. Uh, let's take a look at the difference between this one and this one um, and actually there's no difference, okay? All of these are exactly the same. Get motion from all joysticks, okay? It's just simply so that you can have joystick button zero on that one, and you can have left control, right control. So in other words, you can either use keyboard to control it, or you can use like a joypad to control it, okay? Um, the way that you write these is all lowercase, okay? If I try and put, let's say, I put zero without a space on the end. Notice it'll just disappear. Okay, so if it does disappear, obviously you can just uh, type it again. 
remember just to put that space after it. We can also create our own. We can, we can put in more. So obviously we, we've got these at the bottom, but all we have to do is change the size of this, make it one bigger, and you can add as many of these as you like. Let's make it 19. Now I've got a duplicate of cancel. I'm going to change the name of it, call it something like custom. You can call it anything you like. Notice that the name now changes. Instead of positive button being escape, I'm going to have it as something like R. I'm going to have the negative button as T. Uh, and the alt positive button is still joystick 1. Okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll leave it like that. So now I can call this custom and it's mapped to both the T and the R buttons. Okay, let's do that. Let's call it from script. So we simply want custom. It needs to be spelled exactly the same as what you put in, in the input manager. And obviously, just so I know that it's working, I'll return that same name. So now when I press Control or O, I don't get anything, but if I press R, I get my custom. If I press T, I get it again. All right, so now I basically mapped those keys to the input manager and this get button down with its string name. So uh, we'll take a look in the next video at axes, which is also another input type. Now let's take a look at another type of input, which is an axes input. So if we go to edit and project settings, we've got these horizontal and vertical axes. Um, so notice that the name of these are axes anyway, to begin with. Uh, so horizontal basically means you're, you're moving left and right. And the negative button is left, positive button is right. Okay, and these are basically your arrow keys on your keyboard, or you can also use A and D when you're using your typical WASD to move in all directions. We also have a gravity that's linked to this. So gravity basically means how long should you be pressing your button before it actually reaches full horizontal length. And the length is between zero and one. Okay, and if it reaches 0 0.001, you get this dead, okay? Which basically means you're not moving at all. All right, you're not moving left or right, so it can tell when you're not moving. Sensitivity, you can make it as sensitive as you like. So if you find that you're actually still moving left and right a little bit, even though you're not actually pressing anything, you would need to make that sensitivity less. All right, or if you're finding that you're not moving quick enough, increase your sensitivity. Uh, snap, this is when you're using um, like a little joystick controller on your joypad. Um, it will actually snap back to dead when you release it. Okay. You can also invert that as well. So for example, if you're making a flying game and you, you want up to be down and down to be up, you can invert that, which is easy enough. Okay, and very importantly, the axes for the horizontal should be coming from the X axis. As you can see, there are a lot of axes. So if, for example, you know that you've got a gamepad controller and it's linked to a specific axis on the joystick, you can also link certain things to that specific axis as well. But we'll get into that a little bit later because that's a bit complex at the moment. And make sure that you get motion from all joysticks you can have up to 16 joystick inputs, which is pretty amazing, but we're gonna get motion from everything. So that's horizontal, and then same thing for vertical. Now, interestingly enough, this is also getting it from x-axis as opposed to y-axis, which is interesting. Uh, still works. Uh, you would expect y-axis, but it's getting it from x-axis. And this one is obviously down up SW, and once again, same sensitivity. And we also have another horizontal and vertical. Uh, and this one's not linked to anything, okay, which is interesting, but it's getting it directly from the joystick itself. Um, yep, I think that's all good. And by the way, uh, jump is linked to space if, if you wanted your character to jump. So to explain this, uh, in the script, I'm just going to do a simple debug and see what values we actually return. So I just want to get rid of 
all of this. I'm going to do a debug dot log, and I'm going to return the input dot get axis, and we get two versions here. We get get axis or get axis raw. Get axis will actually apply some kind of smoothing uh, between zero and one. So if you're pressing right, you're going to get 0 .0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 until it reaches 1. If you're going the other way and you're going left, you're going to get minus 0 0.1, minus 0 0.2, etc. until you reach minus 1.0. If it's get axis raw, it's just instantly going to go from 0 to 1, 0 to minus 1. All right, there's no smoothing in between. So let's try just get access first. Okay, so it needs the actual name in here. So as a string reference, so it's called horizontal, it needs to match it exactly. Uh, oh, sorry, um, I'm not doing an if statement. It's just a command. So um, just put a semicolon in the end there and that will basically return the value of the input get access horizontal. So let's just quickly save that. I'm going to check this and see what values we get. So as I press play, it will probably say zero because I'm not pressing anything. As soon as I press right, check it out. It goes all the way to one at the bottom, but look how it got there. It, uh, I got a total, well now I've got 431 messages. So if we scroll through all of these, check these out, all of these individual numbers basically the strength of when I was pressing right. If I now press left, I'm going to get minus numbers. And if I take myself all the way down to the bottom, do it again. Obviously, it's going to go all the way down to minus one. OK, so that's with smoothing applied. Let's just clear that. Let's try it now with axis raw. Save that. Once again, I'm getting zero, but this time when I press right, I get one. Okay, Let release it, press left, and I get minus one. Notice I don't get those uh, floating point numbers in between. I don't get like 0 0.1, 0 0.2. It just goes directly to this. So it's almost like they're just using integers, which are whole numbers. Okay, so that, that's quite useful. Uh, Axes are extremely useful when, for example, you want character movement or something like that. You want to get your character to be able to use the WASD or the arrow keys to be able to walk forward, to rotate, to turn, to strafe, etc. These are extremely important. All right, so what we could do then with the get axis raw, we could actually use an if statement. So let's do if input get axis raw horizontal and we need some kind of a statement this will at the moment say cannot implicitly convert type float to bool because it's given as a float number which is a decimal point number uh, and what we're looking for is a true or false okay so what we're going to say is if it is greater than zero okay so your greater symbol is shift and the full stop all right if that's the case if it's greater than zero then we want a debug.log and we'll say uh, right on this one we're going right let's just copy all of this control and C control and V and if we now say is less than zero which is shift and the comma so it should be uh, that symbol on your keyboard and this time it's going to say left all right nice and easy so let's save that and give this a go. Okay, so I'll press right. There we go. I'm getting right. Press left and I'm getting left. All right, perfect. Uh, so now a bit of a challenge for you. Um, in the edit project settings as part of our input manager, we've also got vertical. So I want you to test it in the script in the exact same way see if you can get the vertical to return a debug.log up down okay and we'll review that in the next video all 
how did you get on with that task? So hopefully now you've got something that looks like this. So now we've got our if input get axis row vertical is greater than zero, and that's up. Vertical is less than zero, and that is down. Okay, so let's just quickly test this out. So if I press up, I'm getting up. If I press down, I'm getting down. Still got my left and right, and I can also do A, S, W, and D. All right, excellent. Uh, so what I want to do now is use this particular input, this axis, to actually manipulate this object, this cube. Now we've got something in the cube, we've got a transform at the top. So a transform is used to manipulate this object's position, rotation and scale. And I think what we're going to do is basically just manipulate this rotation. Now you can rotate the object on three axes. All right, so if I just go into the scene, you can see over here, um, this little gizmo, it's going to show you the different axes. They are um, related to these arrows. Okay, notice the red arrow is pointing this way, the blue arrow pointing that way in the green, up. The X is going to go along this line, okay. The blue along this line and the green straight up and down. All right, now if I were to move it, obviously I, if I move it on the Y, that means it's going to go up. All right, generally on the X, that's going to go left and right if I'm looking at it this direction, okay? And then the blue generally will go back and forward. However, when you're rotating, it's slightly different. Notice my colors. Now my red is on the top, my green is around the object, and my blue is um, kind of over the top. So if I were to click on this blue line, it will go that way. Okay, I'll just press Control and Z to go back. If I go on red, it will go that way. Control and Z. And if I go on green, that's going to rotate it around like that. That is the Y axis. If you take a look up at the top transform on the rotation, you can see those numbers changing as I drag that around. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to manipulate this Y value on the rotation for this object just to get it to rotate in the game world. If I were, for example, just to click and drag that, you can see that it's turning around easy enough. All right, so I'll just set that back to zero. Now, so it's easier to see, I might also give it a new material as well. So I'll just uh, right click, create a new folder, call this materials, keep everything nice and organized. Inside of here, right click, create a new material, just here, and I'll call it, um, might have one that's uh, maybe a light shade of blue. Okay, so when you create a material, you get all of these uh, options, one of which is color. Okay, so I'll maybe bring this down to a kind of a very kind of pale shade of blue, something like this. And now it's blue. On the cube, we've got a little section called materials. We can then just drag this material directly into there. And now it changes. Oh, actually blue wasn't a good idea because now it's blending in with the background. So let's maybe go with instead kind of a bright orange so that it stands out. Okay, um, so let's get rid of this vertical and thing. So we're just left with our horizontal. And what we're going to say is that if horizontal is greater than zero, we actually want to rotate our object on the y-axis. Okay, so uh, I need to access its transform. So remember on the cube, it's part of the transform and then it's rotation. So that's the order in which you access these. And then we want to access the y. Okay, so I'm going to say transform dot rotation. And then it's going to expect some kind of um, Oh, sorry, not rotation, but rotate. Uh, then it's going to expect some kind of a vector three. So your vector three are all of these together. All right, notice that there are three of them. So that's vector one, vector two, vector three. So when you hear vector three, it's just basically saying X, Y, Z. All right, so the way that we write this is zero, zero, zero. That is effectively a vector three. And what we want to manipulate is 
the y okay so uh, which is the middle one x y z so let's get this to rotate pretty slowly let's do it at 0 0.1 and because it's a floating number floating decimal point which it will tell you cannot convert from double to float I need to put an F on the end so that it knows that it is a floating point number or a decimal number let's copy this paste on here and if it's now going the other way we want it simply to have a minus on it so it will reverse its rotation let's try this now so whenever we press our horizontal it should begin rotating on the Y and go the other way and it should rotate the other way this script is already attached to the cube so let's now try this just check my console to make sure I don't get any errors uh, it may rotate pretty quickly so uh, you may see some flashing imagery so there we go I'm rotating that way but I'm pressing right and it's going the wrong way by the look of it pressing left and it's now going that way all right excellent so now I'm controlling the object using inputs now let's just maybe reverse this so this one is positive this one is negative simply because of where my camera is located it's it's located instead of looking at it this way my camera's around the other way so I'm actually looking at it this way all right that's the reason why so now when I rotate to the right it, it press right it rotates to the right and when I press left it rotates to the left excellent all right but notice it's always rotating at the same time all right it's never getting faster never getting slower it's just rotating um, so what we're going to do in the next video is start taking a look at how we can change this hard-coded number this number that never changes into a variable variable number that can change at any point in the game it's constantly changing all the time So now we're going to begin looking at variables. Variables are extremely important for coding and we'll see why shortly. Uh, in this video I'm going to explain how a variable works. First of all I'm going to actually create a variable. Normally you will create a variable outside of a function unless you want it to be a temporary variable that's used in order for a command to actually work. But normally you'll place your variables up here outside of the functions but inside of the class. This is called caching a variable and it will effectively cache this data to memory so that the computer can remember this. So let's say that we have uh, it's a floating decimal number so it's a float value so let's call it a float uh, and we have to give it a unique name. Let's call it uh, rotate speed okay and we can then uh, just put a semicolon on the end so that is effectively a variable that's how you create a variable um, so let's take a look at what the variable is so in this graphic we can see that it's very similar to a box all right it's just basically a container that sits in your computer's memory that's going to hold some kind of data now this box when what I've just created right there is empty all right it's completely empty it's just a container it needs to know what type of data is going to go in it and it also needs a unique name so let's take a look that's exactly what we've done we've told it it's going to accept a float and we've given it a unique name rotate speed now why do why does every variable need a unique name well let's say that we had 20 boxes and they all had the same name and they're all of the same data type well, it'd be like going into an office full of Michaels. Let's say we've got 20 people called Michael and somebody comes up to you and says, give this document to Michael. Well, you're going to say, which one? Which Michael? The computer's going to do exactly the same, right? So each variable needs its own unique name so that the computer can then reference that. Okay, so we have something called rotate speed. At the moment, it's completely empty. Now, because it's float, it's probably going to say zero. What we can do, we can actually initialize this. So let's set it equal to um, 0 0.1 F. Okay. 
we've effectively done exactly the same as what we've done here, but now we can replace this. So we can have minus rotate speed and we can have rotate speed. So instead of this being a hard coded value, it's now getting it directly from this variable. Okay, which is pretty cool. A variable can either be um, non-accessible in the editor as a private variable. I'll just type private. That means it cannot be accessed outside of this script. And if I save it, I can't even access it from the editor. So if I were to click on cube, check out my script, I cannot access it, I cannot change it. All right, so this is a variable that you want, let's say, never to change. It's always going to stay the same. You don't want to mess with it. However, as soon as I change this to public, it means it can be accessed outside of the script. It can be accessed by other scripts, but it can also be accessed in the editor. So let's take a look. Now we can see that that has now become available in the editor. So on the cube, I can now actually change that speed however I want. And what's great about this is if I take two cubes, so I'm just going to press Control and D, or you can do Edit and Duplicate in order to create a, a new one of these cubes. And I'll just uh, move this one over. So we've now got two of those, right, cube one. I can actually change the speed on this so that it's different to the other cube. So let's make this one 0 0.3. Okay, just down here in rotate speed. It hasn't changed the original cube. That's still 0 0.1, and they're both using the exact same script. But the point is that this variable is now um, being controlled by two different objects. So the number can actually exist in two different states, which is great. Um, whatever I've written here, once I make that public, it actually gets overwritten by what's in the inspector. So that 0 0.3 for this specific cube will override that 0 0.1 that's written there. All right, so let's test this, make sure that it does work. So as I now press right, check it out. One of them is going really fast, the other's going slow. As I press left, we get exactly the same thing. Okay. This is called instancing. All right, so we've effectively got an instance of a script. It's the same script, but it's like a duplicate copy. Almost like, for example, when you go to the cinema to watch a film, you're actually watching an instance of a film. It's a copy of the original. You're not watching the actual original film that they made that sits in the studio somewhere. They create copies, instances. And that's exactly what we've got here. We've got an instance of the original, and we've got another instance of the original. Okay, that's how they can exist in multiple states at the same time. So what we're going to look at in the next video, how can we actually change this um, variable using code in real time? So now we want to take a look at how can we manipulate variables directly in the script. So at the moment, our rotate speed is set to a, a predefined number and it always stays that way. Well, in the update where we're, let's say, um, pressing the horizontal button, we're moving, we can actually increase this rotate speed as we do so. So what we do is we say rotate speed. So we're talking to that variable and then we can do a plus equals and let's give it a number, let's say 0 0.1 F. So what it's effectively going to do every frame, as long as we're pressing right, it's going to increase this number by 0 0.1. And what we're doing here is we're saying plus equals. Okay, so when we take a look at the uh, equals, what it's effectively saying is take the item on the left and add uh, the value on the right. Okay, so that's effectively what an equals does. And by saying plus, we're simply going to be adding that to it. If we simply said rotate speed equals 0.1F, 
it's always going to equal 0.1f. Okay, it's never going to change. But as soon as we add plus to it, it's going to add that to whatever it currently is. Now, in the first frame, it's going to be 0.1f. But in the second frame, because that's added to it, it's going to be 0.2f. Okay, and then in the third, third frame, it's going to check it again. It's going to make it 0.3f, 0.4f, etc. So it's always checking back to this rotate speed. And this is a process called getting and setting. When you've got variables, the first thing it does is it gets the data. Okay, so it goes back to the empty box and now it's got some data in it. It's going to find that data. It's going to take a look at what it currently is. Then it's going to add a value of 0 0.1 and then it's going to set that new value back into that variable so it's like placing it back in the box and then the next frame it's going to go through that same procedure again now let's take this same command let's do control and c control and v on this side and this time because it's going the oh actually this one is the positive that one's the negative so it's the top one that we need to make minus equals 0 0.1 so whatever value this currently is it's going to go the opposite way all right which is going to be interesting so let's save this now and test this so as we now press play and we start moving whoa really fast okay super super fast uh, so what's going on here, this value over frame rates, um, the frame rates are huge, aren't they? Uh, remember that we had something like, I think it was 400 frames per second, maybe. Yeah, about 460, 470. So this 0 0.1 gets multiplied by about 470 per second. Okay, so the longer you add it, obviously it's making that speed extremely fast. Uh, a way that we can actually limit that is make the number a lot smaller or we can do something called multiply by time dot delta time. What this does, the interval in seconds from the last frame to the current one. So it basically says do this only once per frame uh, per second. So in other words, it will add, it will do it over one frame and then it has to wait a full second before it can do it again on another frame. So that's going to slow that way down. All right. Now, why would you use time dot delta time, do you think? Well, let's say that you've got a really, really fast computer and your frames per second are even higher. Let's say you've got like 1,000 frames per second. But then you've got another computer that's really, really slow, really old, and it's getting about 14 frames per second. Well, because that value is entirely dependent on frame rate, you're going to get very different movements between the two computers. So you're not going to get the accuracy. But as soon as you multiply by time dot delta time, doesn't matter what computer you're using, whether it's a slower one or a faster one, they're always going to update once per second. So you're going to get the exact same rotation on all computers. So let's just copy this and paste and now we'll see the difference okay i'll just take my stats off and let's now check this out so when i move this way notice they're going faster but check out what's happening something really weird okay it's going faster now check it out and as long as i hold it it's going faster and faster and faster i release it now if i'm going this way notice it started off fast and then it's going to slow down and then at some point, it's going to hit the point where it stops, and then it's going to start going the other way, and it's going to speed up. Okay, now they're going really, really fast that way. So let's find out what our values are saying. And it's probably because it's hitting zero, and then it's going into minus numbers. So uh, in the update, what I'm simply going to do is do a debug.log. And I'm going to leave myself a message saying rotate speed equals. And then I need to add the rotate speed to that. What that's going to do, it's going to display this rotate speed in real time so that I can see what this variable is saying. So let's save that. 
Now, because I've actually got two cubes, I'm probably going to get two different values. Let's find out. Yep, okay. Uh, so if I move forward, now we can see what's happening. Okay, so now I'm going into minus numbers and I'm hitting 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, etc. Okay, so there we go, minus 1, minus 1 1.5. Five, and it's going really fast now. All right, and then as soon as I stop, now if I go the other way to the left, it starts at 1.7 and now it's going back down again. So now I'm at minus 1.1, etc. So notice that we are manipulating that number. Okay, um, so what if we wanted that when we're going right, it goes really fast to the right. And when we're going left, it instantly goes left. It starts from zero and goes really fast. OK, so what we're going to need to do is check if input get axis raw horizontal is actually equal to zero. That means we're not pressing horizontal in any way. So let's do that. If input dot get axis and it's get axis raw horizontal. And we want to say is equal to zero. So we actually put two equals. Uh, what this does, it says, is the item on the right equal in value to the item on the left? OK, that's why we have to have two. If we simply said one equal, we're going to get an error. OK, it's going to go red. And it's going to say, well, you can't do that because this is expecting, um, it's expecting a, a check. OK, it's expecting an equals equals. You can't set this item to zero in this way because we put an if. All right, as soon as we put equals equals, that's fine. We're checking now. And what we're simply going to say, if that is true, then we're going to set rotate speed back to zero by saying equals zero. Now, notice the difference there. We're saying plus equals 0 0.1. Here, we're simply forcing rotate speed to go all the way back to zero. So let's save that. Remember that we're still doing our debug log, so we should see that data come up in the screen. And if you take a look right down here, right at the very bottom of the screen, you'll actually see the current debug log right there. OK, so at the moment, uh, our rotate speed has automatically gone to zero. So if I move right now, and going this way. Okay, it's speeding up. As soon as I release it, okay, uh, it should have gone back to zero. Let me double check. Yep, that's showing the update. And now when I go the other way, oops, I start going left. There we go. It starts from zero and it's speeding up. If I stop, go this way. And now it's starting to go this way and speeding up. They both go in in the exact same rotation. That's kind of weird. But my rotate speed is 0 0.9, 0 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1 1 stop. And then as I start again, they start spinning around again. But this time it's going minus. Just take a look at this. Yep, still got my minus. Still got this. Hmm. OK. Um, yeah. All right. So that's how we can manipulate and change variables in a script, actually, at runtime. Now, at the moment, this is 0 and this is 0. So this is our x axis and this is our z axis. As a bit of a challenge, what I want you to do is create two more uh, float variables. Remember, you've got to give them a uni unique name so you can't use rotate speed again you can call it something else and I want you to use the, that value here in the X and here in the Z and also on this one as well uh, and then I want you to do exactly what we've done here where you say rotate speed minus equals 0 0.1 but whatever new name you've given your variables put that in there as well also on this one and when input get axis raw is horizontal 
I want you to reset all of them back to zero. Okay, so this is a bit more of a challenge, but you're going to get used to using variables if you complete this task. How did you get on with that task? You should now have three inputs uh, for your objects on your cube. So I'm just going to quickly take a look. So um, I've called mine rotate X speed and rotate Z speed. Uh, just going to get rid of this debug. We don't need that anymore. We know what that's doing. So now you'll notice that it's, I've got this, which is exactly just like rotate speed. The only difference is it's accessing the different name. Okay, exactly the same with rotate Z speed. And I'm making sure that the rotate X speed is in the X part of the vector three and the rotate Z speed is in the Z part of the vector three. Exactly the same on this side. Once again, just change that hard coded number of zero with this variable name. And then finally, if horizontal is equal to zero, we're now setting rotate X speed to zero, rotate Z speed to zero. Okay, and let's just take a look at this in action. So now when we actually rotate, we're getting very kind of different, um, very different movements, okay? So it's rotating all three axes. And in fact, if I just scroll up here, if we take a look at this rotation, we can actually see those values changing in real time. Okay, it's actually manip uh, manipulating those using the script. They're getting faster and faster. And then as soon as I release, it slows right back down to zero again. Okay, excellent. So you'll notice that in our script, we've got our slots. The, these, this is basically an empty box that sits in our memory and we can allocate data to this. We can just type numbers directly in there. Uh, but let's take a look at our script. Um, effectively, we've got three floats. Now it's okay when you're using like about three, four, five floats, something like that. What if we had to use 300 floats? Okay, it's going to get very kind of time consuming when we have to type all of this out. We've got to type 300 of these, then we've got to access them all in data and we've got our script is going to become huge. Well, this is where our single array can be placed, uh, sorry, our single variable can be, can be replaced by an array variable. Let's take a look at an array. So an array is very similar to a single variable. The difference, however, is that you can put multiple objects in the same box. Once again, it has to be of a certain type of data. You can't mix and match different types of data. So we're working with floating decimal point numbers at the moment. All the data in here must all be floating point decimal numbers. You only need to give this array one single name. Each item will have its unique index number. It starts from 0, 1, 2. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, if I just come down here and I say public float, and this time I, I open and close square brackets. Okay, and that creates an array. Okay, it tells it it's gonna, it's, it's like basically saying this is a box and it's gonna have multiple items inside it. And then I need to give it a unique name. Now, when I'm creating names, I don't have to use these rotate speed, rotate X speed. I could just call it Joe, for example. That's perfectly fine. Okay, the only issue with that is it doesn't make any sense to what we're doing at the moment. So we want our variable names to actually make sense. What is this variable intended to do? Since it's intended to rotate the object, I could simply call this something like rotator. All right, that's technically what it's doing. Um, so as long as it makes sense, that is fine. Now, if I save this and go back to take a look in Unity, we'll now see that we've got a little section called rotator. And if I open this, this is what an array looks like. I can type any value I like. Well, since I've got three values, I'll type three in there, press enter. And now effectively I get three slots. Very similar to this, but I don't, I don't have to create three separate variable names. Uh, 
these are the index numbers. So element 0, 1, 2. So remember in the image, the index numbers 0, 1, 2, etc. You can have as many of these as you like. So let's say I wanted 300. Now the problem, it'll go and create 300 of these. All right, so massive amount. Uh, but I only want three. Okay, uh, and once again, very much like we've done here, we can actually initialize these values. So let's say for cube zero, 01, uh, or the original cube will give it zero, 01 on element zero, 01, and 2. Okay, so we can just type those values in there. Then let's go over to our cube 1. Once again, let's give it 3. And this time I'm going to make these 0, 3 on all of them. So 0 0.3. 0 0.3, 0 0.3. Now, when we're accessing the array, it's slightly different to accessing the singular array. What we need to do is use its index number here. So, first of all, we're going to access its name, so it's rotator, and then we open and close uh, angular brackets, the square brackets rather, uh, and we need to give it its index number, which is one. Okay, now how do I know that's one? Because that's the one right in the middle there, and that's equivalent. Uh, I did it basically as y, x, z. All right, so that's gonna be that number. Now I can just copy this, let's say, control and C, and let's put this in the middle. Let's put this over here. And so now uh, the Y was at index zero and the Z was at index uh, two. Remember it always starts at zero. So zero, one, two. So there are three elements. And effectively we can just do the exact same over here. So let's just copy and paste. I like to copy and paste because it's a lot quicker than actually retyping everything. Okay, so now where we get these rotate speed, we obviously just need to change these to our rotators. So we started with zero, didn't we? So let's just copy that. We can now basically just replace that with rotator zero, rotator zero, rotator zero. And in fact, I'll just put this in and just change the numbers. It's fine, I'll just paste these in here. These two as well. Okay, so this one is number one. This one is number two. Um, this one is one and two. One and two. There we go, and we're now using an array. So what I can actually do now, I can actually take these public floats at the top can delete them. We're no longer using them, all right we're now using an array and it's getting its number from those indexes. Let's make sure that it still works. So let's press save, wait for that to update. And you'll notice that those have all disappeared and we've, we're now left with our array. So now when we click play, once again, still working perfectly fine. And you can see in that array that we're at, the data is, is updating automatically. All right, excellent. So that's two different types of, um, of variables. All right, whether it's a single variable or an array variable. What we're gonna look at in the next video is the types of data that you can put into an array uh, or into a variable. We want to take a look at what kind of data can we put into variables. Um, so we're, we're focusing specifically on like um, data itself, so whether in numbers or booleans, and we'll take a look at this. Um, so you'll find a resource in this session called Types of Data. So it's just a, a, a web address. So if you just want to go there, it will bring you to this page. Okay. Um, this is on the Unity documentation and it actually comes from one of their um, inbuilt systems called Bolt. Bolt is visual scripting. 
All right, if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. It's pretty cool, um, but it's completely visual, as you can see here with all sorts of icons, etc. Uh, what we're taking a look at is the most common types of data variables, and we'll generally be using floats, integers, booleans, and strings. Okay, these are the four common types of data variables. Um, when generally we, as it says here, rarely used characters. These are just individual either letters or numbers uh, from your keyboard. All right, as opposed to like a number in this format. Uh, we'll get into enums and vectors a little bit later. All right, and we're going to get into all these others as well a little bit later. But for now, I just want to focus on the basics. So a float, which is what we've been using, is a number with or without decimal values. All right, so it, it stands for floating decimal point numbers. Um, and notice that we're currently using those. Okay, so let's just take a look at our script. So there we go, float. All right, and that allows us then to have like the 0.1s, um, etc. Okay, and these are actually quite precise as well. So if you want a, a value that's going to be very, very precise, uh, you want to use a decimal point number. So it's not just limited to one, two, three. You can have like 2.3, 2.5, etc. So that it's a lot more precise. Um, the next one is an integer. Okay, so this is a number without a decimal value. So this one's less precise. You're going to use whole numbers only. Uh, and you type it like this. So public and it's int. So of type integer. All right, and then obviously, once again, you'd have to give it its own unique name. So let's just call it my integer. Uh, and don't put spaces in the names, actually. Um, if you did want to put a space, you would use an underscore if you did want a space, okay, as opposed to an actual space. Because what it would technically do is recognize only the first part, and then you'll presumably get a red squiggle. It'll say my, and then it'll say, what on earth is this? I'm not expecting that. So let's just keep that together. Um, so that's how you write an integer. And when you're declaring it, uh, you can just declare it by saying something like three. You don't need to put an F on the end like we've been doing here. We only put an F on the end because that is a floating point value. We're telling it. Uh, if we take the F off of here, we might get a squiggle. Okay, and because it's recognizing something called a double. Okay, a double is once again a decimal point number, uh, but I believe a double can actually hold far more um, decimal points, uh, de decimal point numbers, if you like, than a float. So that can hold sort of probably thousands or maybe even millions or something, I'm not sure. Whereas a float is the more common type of decimal number that you will use. Uh, then we've got our boolean. Okay, a boolean is a value that can only either be true or false. Think of it almost like a light switch. You can either switch it on or off. Okay, and it's commonly used in logic or in toggles. And in fact, we're using them ourselves. We're using them with this if statement. So we're saying if the input get axis raw is greater than zero, that can either be true or false. All right, it can't be anything else. If it is greater than zero, that means that's true, so it's going to run all of that. If it's false, it's actually then just going to skip all of that and go down to the next statement. So let's take a look at an example, just an example offline. Okay, um, something like a lamp doesn't work. It comes down here, it's got this Boolean statement, this if statement, is the lamp plugged in? It's effectively either going to be true or false. If it's true, it's going down the yes line. If it's false, it's going to the no line. OK, this is called a branch statement. It's a branch statement because it's got two branches, true or false. So if it's false, you just plug in the lamp. If it's true, you check another statement as the bulb burned out. If it's true, yes, replace the bulb. If it's false, no, repair the lamp. OK, so this is what's called uh, like a logic sequence or logic toggle sequence. OK, uh, and it's what technically we're using here. Now to declare a boolean, you will say public bool, 
Okay, that's the name for the boolean. Once again, you'll have to give it a name. Let's call it my bool. And when you're declaring it, it's either true or false. Okay, so let's just say it's true. And that's how you set up a boolean. Then we get a string, okay, which is a piece of text like a name or a message. Um, we're using those as well. Okay, we've got a string there. All right, a string always appears inside of quotation marks. Okay, so to declare a string, public of type string, let's call it my string. And when you're declaring it, it always has to be in quotation marks. So let's say, let's call it anything. And then we can use that in our code. That might be useful, for example, if you're creating the game and you want your character to have a certain name, you can store that name inside of that variable. Now let's take a look back into Unity at one of our cubes, and we'll notice that we get our various uh, variables that we've just created. We've got an integer, we've got a boolean, that's a little checkbox that can either be, that's false when it's off, that's true when it's checked on. And then we've got a string that allows us then to enter anything. So let's call it something this time. So notice it, it accepts three different types of data and these are all accepting uh, decimal points. If I try and make this 3.2, notice it won't allow me to actually enter the point. It just completely ignores the point and I end up with 32. This, however, I can actually just give it zero or I can give it one because remember on the guide, float a number with or without decimal values. Okay, it doesn't mind. Um, so let's take a look, for example, at the my ball. Okay, how could we use that my ball? Well, in the update, we could use an if statement. Generally, you will always use an if statement with a ball because you you need to basically check whether it's true or false. So we can say if my ball is equal to true. Remember, when you're checking if something is equal, you will always use the two equal symbols. So if that's the case, then we'll do a debug.log. Um, I'll say bool is true. Save that. Let's go back into here. Let's uh, press play. And we should now see bool is true. Because it's in the update, it's running constantly. All right, it's always true. Now, what if in both of the cubes, I set the ball to false so that it's not running at all in either script. Now, when I press play, notice I don't get any message because that statement is no longer true. All right, my ball is false, so that is no longer met. So it completely ignores that. Now, I can also reverse that as well. I can say if my bool is equal to false. Let's just do the debug.log. Uh, bool is false. Okay, let's check it now. So when we press play, obviously now ball is false. But what if, for example, during runtime, I check that ball on, now I get ball is true. Okay, shows up. So it, it's a way in which you can detect what, what kind of condition it's in. Now you don't have to, if you've already got if my ball is equal to true, you don't have to actually type if my ball is equal to false. You could simply type else. Else means the reverse of whatever this is. It's exactly the same as saying if my ball is equal to false. It's it's just, if that one's not true, then else do this. Okay, let's try that and make sure that that does work. So let's press play again. And there you go, ball is false. So it definitely works. Switch that on, ball is true. Okay, so we've got a variety of different data types 
that we can actually plug, put in our variables. Now when we're working with if statements uh, and we're using this else, this only applies to what is directly above it. Okay, if this else, let's say if we had about five if statements, it would only apply to the one that's directly above it. It wouldn't apply to all five of the if statements. Okay, uh, so it's worth bearing that in mind. Now imagine, for example, that we wanted a toggle, almost like when we click, we want it to do one thing. When we click again, we want it to do another. So let's have an input. If input dot get mouse button down, let's say the left mouse button. Let's contain all of this within that if statement. Uh, what I can do here in the first one is say my ball equals false. So effectively I'm switching that. So each time that I press uh, this button, it will actually change. Okay, it'll change back. Um, first it will be true. And then when I click again, it will be false as long as I have that else. Okay, so I'm just gonna save this. Uh, make sure that my cubes are set onto true. So if yours aren't, just make sure that they're checked. So when I press play now, the first time I click, ball is true. The next time I click, ball is false. Exactly the same operation, but I get two different results. Okay, and that's what's great about using these if statements along with these booleans. Okay, particularly with the else. Now we're not restricted to just using a boolean variable we could also use a boolean to check any other uh, data variable. So let's say something like my integer. Let's say if my integer, and obviously it's not true or false, uh, we're gonna say is equal to three. Okay, so we're gonna check that. Now that the outcome of that can either be true or false. Either it is equal to three or it's not. If it is, then bool is going to be equal to true. Then we can say my integer equals, let's say, uh, four. Okay, so the next time it runs, we're going to get a false. Let's just try that out. Okay, so I'm just going to press play. Okay, bool is true. Next time I click, bool is false. Now, what if we wanted numerous checks? So not just against three, but against other things as well. So let's just copy this. Control and C, Control and V, Control and V. So I want two of these. What if my integer is equal to four? What if my in integer is equal to five? And what I'm going to do here is change these. Okay, five and six. Now we're gonna notice something strange uh, and we're gonna come back and, and see why we get this in a second. Let's just save this and run it. So when I click, I'm gonna get all three are true at the same time. That's because the Boolean technically was moved up to four, uh, sorry, started at three and then four and then five all in one go. Okay, uh, the reason why all the if statements, they're all true, because each time we are changing them to a different number. If we only want them to run one time when we click the input, we need this else. But instead of just saying else on its own, we can say else if. Okay, and then else if. What this means if the first one's true, ignore all of this. If the first one isn't true, but the second one is true, then ignore all of this. And then if all the, the top three, in the words, this one is also false as well, then do the final one. Okay, let's try that again. Boom. 
bull is true. Notice it only run once. Once again, bull is true. Once again, bull is true. And then finally, bull is false. So each time it changed and it was considering which one is the correct one. Okay, so we've got an if and we've got an else if and we've got just a general else. So when we're using the if statements, those are, are the kind of the ways that we would do those. We can also do the same thing with my string. Okay, so we could say if my string is equal to anything. Okay, and it has to be a match for whatever it is. So if you're comparing a string, you need to write it in string format. Okay, if that's the case, then bool is true. Um, let's do a copy on this. Let's do a paste and a paste. And let's say if my string is equal to something, if my string is equal to nothing, else and I'll say um, I'll say string not identified let's say that so here I'll get uh, nothing on this one I'll return something and on this one I'm going to return anything now when I'm changing it I could easily say my string equals something. Next, uh, I could say my string equals something that isn't there. So let's say different. And then finally, say my string equals, and if I just put a space, that is how you actually write a blank string. So in other words, if you want it to appear as nothing, that's how you would actually write it. Okay, so that, that would show absolutely nothing. Let's save it now and see what we get. So I'll get something, then I get string not identified because something became anything once again. Uh, let me just change this to anything. Uh, I think, yep, should be, let me double check it actually. My string is equal to anything, yeah. So I think I rewrote the string on that one. So let me try it again. So anything on both of those, and let me try it again. So now it says anything to begin with, then it says something, and then it says string not identified. So notice that you can actually compare almost anything. All right, and, and the outcome of this is either true or false. So in the next video, we'll take a look at um, how can we have two or more conditions inside of our if statements. Now in this video, we want to take a look at how can we have multiple conditions inside of a single if statement. Okay, so if we take a look at our script, at the moment, it's only comparing one statement. It's basically if my string is equal to anything. Well, we can add to this. Uh, and there's two ways that we could do this. We could say and, or we could say or. Okay, so let's start with and. So you would write it by putting in two and symbols. That means the item on the left and the item on the right both have to be true. Okay, so now I could say my ball is equal to true. So for this to actually run, both of these conditions would have to be met. Okay, so now I could say debug.log anything, uh, my string equals something, and then I could say my ball equals uh, false. That would mean that this would no longer be met. So then it will come down to else if my string is equal to something. Let's try that. So first time I run, I get anything. Next time, something. Next time, string not identified. 
Now, if we try it on the second one and we say, and, and, my ball is equal to true. This point, because we set my ball equal to false, it means that the second else if statement is no longer going to be true. One of the conditions is true, the other condition is not. So it's going to completely ignore this one. Save it. So what I'm expecting now is anything string not identified. So I get anything and then string not identified. So it completely missed out uh, this second one. But what if I change this to or? Okay, so to do this, it's uh, this type of a symbol. It's two straight lines. On my keyboard, that is shift and the backspace key, uh, sorry, backslash key. Okay, which is on my keyboard, that's right next to my Z key, just above my Alt key. Okay, so I press shift and that. It might be slightly different on your keyboard, or if you're on a Mac, it might be slightly different. Just type into Google, how do I type the OR symbol, O-R. So what this means now is one or the other condition needs to be met, but not both. And when we're gonna find out that something is met, even though the second condition is not. So it's still going to run. So now we're going to see anything. And then once again, we see something and now string not identified. Okay, so it did run um, because at least one of those conditions was true. So we get two different ways in which we could do that. And there, there are no limits to how many conditions you could put in there. I could add another one. I could say, and, and my integer is, and instead of saying equal to three, I could say is greater than zero. Okay, which technically it is. Three is greater than zero. So that will still be true. So let's save that. Let's try it now. So I should get anything. Yep, so I still get anything. And then it goes down to something. Now, if I were to say is less than zero, this will no longer be true because at least one of those conditions is not true and they all need to be met. Now it goes directly to something. It's completely ignored anything. Okay, second time it's something again. Third time something, fourth time something. The reason why, because only one of these conditions need to be met. Okay, so even though the my string something has actually changed to different, the bool has not been changed. So the bool is still true, which means technically this is still being met. Okay, so it's pretty powerful stuff using if statements in this way. And a little bit later, once we actually start to make a basic game, we're going to see how we can use all of these uh, things that we're learning about in a practical way to actually make the game work. Now, when we have uh, multiple types of data, uh, sometimes we're going to struggle to actually pass data between variables because they exist in different types. So for example, if we wanted to take a float variable and pass it into uh, an integer variable, we're going to struggle. All right, we're going to have difficulties. If we want to pass any of these items into a ball, we're going to have difficulties. If, we're go if we want to basically pass uh, an integer data into a string, we're going to have trouble. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to overcome that. First of all, uh, when we get something like a float value, let me create a new one. Let me call it public float. Uh, let me call it new float. Let me make it something like 2.7. Uh, this type of variable can accept either decimal numbers or whole numbers. Okay, so if, for example, I said new float equals my integer, shouldn't have a problem. All right, because that particular data type can easily accept that type of data. 
But if I reverse that and I say my integer equals new float, now I'm going to get an issue. All right, little red squiggle simply says cannot implicitly convert type float to integer. And it tells me, are you missing a cast? The reason why integers only accept whole numbers. They cannot accept decimal numbers, but we can use a cast. Okay, so to do this, we open and close brackets and tell this float what type of a what type of data it should become in order for it to be passed into this variable. So we want it to become an integer. As soon as I tell it what type to become, it's fine, it works. But in doing so, it's going to get rid of that decimal point. So this is now going to simply become two. So the integer is going to read two. Uh, if I wanted to do something similar, let's say I wanted my integer equal to my string, for example. Once again, I'm going to get an issue. Cannot implicitly convert type string to integer. Now, unfortunately, I can't do a cast like this and just say turn it into an integer because it doesn't allow to. For this one, you need to do something slightly different when you're working with strings. What we effectively need to do is pass the data. Okay, so we're going to say int dot pass. Okay. And then we need to put this inside our brackets. So when it says pass, effectively what it means is convert the uh, string numbers, and it'll only be able to accept numbers, into integer actual numbers. If it's in text, which it currently is, we're going to get an error. Okay, and I'll show you that now. Debug.log. I want to see what my integer is display. Just save that. Wait for that to compile. So now if I check this, make sure that my errors are switched on. And at the moment it's saying anything. So if I press play now, I'm going to get a red error. Okay. Format exception input string was not in correct format. Okay. That's quite an unusual error probably won't see that very often, but what it means is this is text. I cannot pass it into an integer because it's the incorrect format. If I make this something like one, two, three, four, do the same on the other one, one, two, three, four. So any kind of numbers, try it again now. I don't get an error and now it's converted into actual numbers. It's now become one, two, three, four. And you can see that because my integer is now one, two, three, four. So I can pass data from text into number format as long as it's the correct format. It's numbers and not letters. Okay, um, if we want to go the other way around, and let's say we want a my string to become my integer. So let's say my string equals my integer. Or once again, I'm going to get an issue, an error, it simply says cannot implicitly convert type int to string. Now, if we try casting by saying string, okay, once again, it doesn't work. All right, you cannot do it that way. Instead, there's a slightly different way to do this. We say my integer dot to string, open and close brackets. As soon as we've done that, it now converts that number into like text, it's still a number, but it's represented as text now with the quotation marks. So what you can see there, there's three different ways in which to actually cast data between types. You're probably not going to be doing that overly. Uh, you know, you're not going to be using it too much in, in your games, but occasionally you might need to fall back on that. You might need to take data from one type and convert it to another. So casting is how you would do that. And there are a few different examples that I've just shown you there. Uh, now we want to take a look at uh, a different variable that is the variable of game object. Okay, so as it says here, game objects are the base entity in Unity scenes. Each game object has a name, a transform for its position and rotation, as well as a list of components. 
So in Unity, anything that exists in the hierarchy is a game object. Okay, so for example, this cube one, it has a name and it has a transform that has its position, rotation and scale. Exactly as it said, it also has a list of components. All of these are components. Components are items that belong to an object. Okay, and you can add components here at the bottom. You've got a wide variety of components that you can add, tons and tons of stuff. You can also see a list of the, those components under the component drop down. So as you can see, there's a huge amount of stuff and we'll get into a little bit of this uh, later and manipulating some of these. Okay, um, so what we're gonna do is access the component variable in the script and manipulate it in some way. Uh, so for this, I'm actually gonna remove the input event script from the cubes. So I'm just gonna right click and remove component. It doesn't get rid of the script, the script still exists. It just removes it off these game objects. So now I want to write a new script. So I'm just going to right click create C sharp script and I'll call this um, object variables. Okay, just wait for that to update. Okay, now we've got a blank. Uh, so when we want to access a game object, once again, we can have it as public it's of type game object. It should go this green color. Once again, it needs a name. All right, so uh, I could either call it my object, I could call it like uh, any object, or because I'm accessing a cube, I could even just call it cube. Okay, it makes sense. That's the point of it. Once I've done that, and I press save, I'm just going to apply this object variables to both cubes. Now you notice that we get this little slot. That is that particular variable. And this is looking for a type of game object. You can even click this little target and it will show you all of your game objects that exist in the scene. What's great about the target is it will show you all the available items of the correct type. So if it was a different type, it would show all of those. Now, if I, for example, drag this cube into there, that will fit. Okay, I could drag, for example, the directional light, that would fit, even the main camera, anything that exists in the hierarchy. Okay, if I try and drag, for example, this script in there, notice that that wouldn't work because the script is not a game object. If, for example, the physics materials, if I try and drag this in there, that wouldn't work because it's not the correct type. Uh, let's say that we have the cube in there. And on the second one, I'm going to leave this empty. So it's a completely empty game object. Let's say that I want to do something. So uh, one of the most basic things that you can do with a game object is switch it off. You simply switch a, a game object off by clicking this little checkbox. All right, and this is called the uh, set active box. So what we could do there, in the start, we could say cube dot set active to false. All right, what that means is switch it off. Let's save that. And let's try running that now, knowing that one of them is associated with the first cube and the second one as an empty game slot. I'm expecting an error, which I've got. I've got an unassigned reference exception. The variable cube of object variables has not been assigned. But notice it has switched one of my cubes off, the one that had the cube attached. The second one, because it's an empty slot, it doesn't know which object I actually want to switch off. I'm basically saying switch off the cube, it looks in the box, in, in the variable space, and it says, well, there's nothing in there. How can I switch it off? There's nothing in there. So unassigned reference exception basically means you've got an empty slot somewhere or your reference does not exist. As soon as I put that into there and now both of them have references, they both get switched off and I don't have any errors. Okay, because it's been full. 
and now it knows exactly what it should do. And notice they both got switched off, all right, which is great. What if I wanted to do it at a set time in the update? Well, I could have an input. If input uh, dot get mouse button down, let's use the left mouse button. And then I could take this command control X to cut control V to paste, or you can use your edit. You can use any of these. Okay. So now in the update, every frame is listening for me to press the left mouse button. And when I do, it's going to set both cubes false. Let's save that. So now you notice they didn't get switched off until I press my left mouse button and both of them get switched off. All right, excellent. What if we wanted only one of the cubes to be switched off, but they both got the exact same script? Well, this is where we can use a Boolean variable like we did last time. Okay, so we could have this as public of type bool. And I could call uh, this Let's call it cube one. Okay, and make that false to begin with. Then inside of here, um, I'm going to use a nested if statement. So this is a second if statement inside of the first. I'm going to say if cube one is equal to true. And in fact, that's not such a great name of cube one because it's confusing. So I've got two cubes and I'm saying, is it cube one? That can be very misleading. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to refactor that. I'm going to change the name of this cube one. Okay. So I'm going to go to edit. I'm going to go to refactor. I'm going to choose rename. What this allows me to do is change both of these items at the same time. So all I need to do now is just rename it. So let's call it, um, invisible. Let's call it. Notice that both of them got changed. Click apply and it's easily refactored. Okay. If, for example, that particular Boolean appeared 30 times in your script, you don't want to go through the script 30 times and change it. You just do that refactoring. It will do it immediately for you. Okay. So now when I save that, you'll notice that on the cube, I've now got a little checkbox. So let's say the first cube, I do want it to be invisible and the second cube I don't. So now when we press play, notice only one of the cubes actually uh, got switched off. Now in the last video, we asked the script to switch the game object off and we've got a link to the specific game object, but notice that the game object is itself. Okay. It's basically the cube. It's whatever the script is attached to. So another way of actually writing this, instead of actually having it link to a game object, we can just say itself. And the way that we do that is to type this and then dot game object. Okay. This means whatever this script is attached to, whatever object this script is attached to. Let's just check it and it will work exactly the same way. In fact, I can even comment this game object out just so that you can see it will still work perfectly fine. Okay. Works exactly the same way. Uh, now where it gets interesting by having a game object uh, variable is that we can actually talk to other objects. So I'm going to leave the uh, game object in there. And what I'm going to do is on cube, I'm going to drag cube one into there. And on cube one, I'm going to drag cube into there. So they're talking to each other. Basically they're recognizing each other. So now I can ask uh, unity to check if the cube uh, is still active in the hierarchy. That basically means, is it switched on? If it's in this kind of a state, it means it is inactive. It's grayed out. Okay. Now that's quite a useful thing to check. 
And so now I can say just outside of this if invisible is true, I can say if cube dot active in hierarchy. Okay, and there are a few different things we can have. Just active on its own, that's normally used when um, you're actually inside of the script itself and you want to make sure it is actually active. Active in hierarchy will go forward and check the hierarchy to make sure it's not switched off. Active self, once again, is making sure that this script is actually active. The game object might be switched on, but the script itself might be switched off. So then you can check that. And then set active and set active recursively obviously switches an item on. Okay, so we, we want to choose active in the hierarchy. Now, because it's an if statement, we want to return a true or false statement. So we're going to say if cube.active in the hierarchy is equal to false. Okay, if that's the case, if it's actually being switched off, then we want to reverse this Boolean. So we want to say invisible equals true. So what this is going to do, it's going to switch one cube off. And then the next time we click our mouse again, it will switch the second cube off. Okay. And in fact, let me do an else if. Okay. Otherwise it will instantly uh, switch it off, I believe. So let's try this now. So the first time I click, I get one cube go. Second time I click, the third time I click, okay, I get the cube go off. So let me just remove the else. So that I've got two if statements and let's try that again. So first time I click, yep, just one goes off. Second time I click, Third time I click, it goes off. The reason why, the first time that I clicked, the cube active in hierarchy, uh, it was still active. So the second time I clicked, it then became false. Invisible mate was made true. The third time I clicked, then the cube went off. Okay, so you can actually see the logic working. You can actually follow how this script is working as you start to figure out what is happening based on the input. And all of this is game logic. Okay, so you can actually construct the game logic in any way you like in order to achieve the result that you're looking for. Uh, now in the next video, I wanna take a look at uh, using a game object and using its transform. And we'll be taking a look at vectors in order to do that. Now we want to take a look in this video at vectors. Okay, so um, vectors represent a set of float coordinates, for example, for positions or directions. So vector two is associated with 2D games, X and Y, which is uh, horizontal and vertical. Vector three has three coordinates. Okay, X, Y, and Z, where X is width, Y is height, and Z is depth. Uh, vector 4, although it says rarely used, this is actually a quaternion uh, that is used in rotations. Okay, so once again, you've got the three vectors, which represent space, and then the W represents time. Okay, so the time in which it takes for an object to move in space around its pivot, around its center. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but for now, we're going to be working with vector 3s. So let's take a look. So each item, each object, they all have transforms. They all have these vectors. So we've got vectors for position, rotation, and scale. So the X is vector one, the Y is vector two, and the Z is vector three. When we take a look in our scene view, uh, I'm just gonna move around a little bit so that I can see this gizmo. In fact, let me match it up so that we can see it with the actual cube. We can see that the Z is the blue, that's representing the depth or moving back and forward. The Y is going up and down and the X is moving left and right. Okay, so these are the vectors, uh, particularly on position. When we change over to rotation, we're gonna notice that the red, which is the X, is now gonna rotate the object that way. Okay, the blue is gonna rotate the object that way. And the green is gonna rotate the object around its center that way. 
when we go to scale, we're going to see exactly the same as what we got with uh, position. But now we can actually scale an object just on a specific vector if we wanted. So we can make it wider, we can give it more depth, or we can give it more height, for example. Okay, and this is all numeric data that we can then use as a variable. variable. So what we're going to do, we're going to get one of our cubes to move into the position where our other cube used to be. All right, so uh, what we need to do is declare a new variable of type vector3. So public vector, and as you can see, we get vector3s. We can get them as integers or as floats. We can get a vector2 for 2D, vector3, or even a vector4 if you wanted to use it in that way. So vector three, and then we'll give it a new name. Let's call it uh, cube position, perhaps. And there we go. Okay, so if I now press save, and we check out our cube, we can now see that it's presented in an XYZ format, exactly like what we've got up here. But at the moment, by default, they're empty. Okay, it's saying completely zero. So what we want to do, we, we actually want to copy the other objects position. So we want these values to appear here in these boxes. So the way that we could do this, we could do this at the start. So we could simply say cube position equals uh, cube, which is the game object dot transform dot position. And that will then pass that data directly into this vector three. So first we're accessing the transform, then we're accessing the position and we're getting that value. So let's try this now. Let's just press play. Notice my values are now updated. Minus 6.16, 4.11, 1.23. When we click on cube one, that's the exact same values that we've got there. And so now in our script, what we can do we can say if cube acti active in hierarchy is equal to false, instead of saying invisible equals true, let's just uh, comment that bit out. And instead, let's actually move our cube to the cube position. So we actually reverse what we've got here, it's an exact reversal. So we're going to say this, as in this game object, dot game object dot transform dot position equals cube position and that will then move the object now why did I do this dot game object dot transform dot position let's take a look what we're accessing is the script okay so when we access the script we then need to go up to its game object back down to its transform. We need access to this transform. And then what we want to say is set our position to whatever these values are saying. So we're going to move it into that position. And that's technically what it's doing, right? So it's saying set our position to whatever is registered in this variable of cube position. So let's try this now. So when I press play, that one disappeared, but now watch this cube, it should appear over here. So I click and then it moves over to there. All right, so that's pretty interesting. Uh, it allows us then to manipulate objects, move them around, and actually um, know where other objects are located in 3D space. So vector 3s are extremely important in coding. And we're going to get into that a little bit later when we actually start manipulating objects, moving them around, creating character controllers and those kind of things. Now let's imagine that we take, for example, the original cube and I'm going to rotate it in a certain way so that it's different to the first cube. Then I'm also going to go into scale. I'm just going to scale it up in the middle so that when we take a look at it in the game view it's completely different to the original one. Okay so what I want is very similar to what I've done with cube one to, to set its position relative to the first cube. I actually want it also to take on the rotation and the scale 
of that cube, that first cube that basically disappears. So to do this is slightly different to what we've done so far. This is a vector three, but for a rotation, we actually use a quaternion instead of a vector three. So a quaternion is technically a vector four. Okay, it's four dimensional math. All right, X, Y, Z and W. So when we go in here, we can type public of type quaternion. Okay, and we can call this cube rotation. Then public vector three, call it cube scale. Uh, so in the start, we can, in fact, I'll just copy this, control and C, control and V, control and V. I'm going to say cube rotation. It's going to equal this. Now it goes red because it's going to say the world space position of the transform. It cannot implicitly convert type vector three to quaternion. A rotation always has to be a quaternion if you're trying to record the value of it. So that's when it becomes rotation. Okay, as soon as we do that, it fixes the issue. Now for cube scale, uh, we want to set this to the cube transform, but instead of position, we want dot. Now if you try typing scale, you're going to get local scale. All right, that's the one that you need to use. You can't use just scale on its own. It's the local scale that is relative to this particular object. Okay, so that will then set those values. Then we have to pass those over to the object itself. So let's just copy this, paste and paste. So now we can say the dot rotation is gonna equal cube dot rotation or cube rotation rather. And the cube transform and remember it has to be a local scale is going to equal cube scale all right there we go so now we can actually copy those values so we'll see that we've got a whole bunch of uh, numbers down here so now when we press play they get updated and you will notice that the cube rotation uh, and the cube scale are all being copied from this particular cube. So we've got the exact values. This one is obviously the original default values of this cube. So now when I click this and I click again, we get a perfect duplicate. It's actually taken on those values of the original object. All right, so it's pretty useful. Um, now we can actually set an entirely new set of uh, values. So let's say, um, let's put in a new input actually. So let's say if input dot get mouse button down, this time let's say it's the right mouse button. And we're gonna just take this one Control and C, Control and V. I can say this game object transform dot position equals uh, a new vector three, and in here I can then declare a new vector three. Now, where did it start? Let's take a look. So, I'm going to basically put it right back to where it was. So, minus three point five nine is the x four eleven is the y and 1.23 is the z all right so as soon as i do that uh cannot convert double to float so all of these need f's on the end okay then i can take this control and c control and v control and v and i can say rotation now obviously I'm going to get a red error now because I can't convert a vector three to a quaternion. So I need to say new quaternion. 
and a quaternion has four values. Okay, and this is going to be zero. All right, so I want it to be zero on the X, Y, and Z across zero time, so immediately, basically. And then finally, we, we want the local scale equal to a new vector three, and it's just going to be one. All right, so I'm just going to type one into here. That will return it right back to its original values. So uh, let's try this out now. So if I press play, left click, left click again, right click, goes right back to where it was. But it doesn't look like it traveled back to where it was originally. Let me just double check that. It was all the way over there, wasn't it? I think I took the position values off the original cube, not the cube one. Okay, that's the reason why. But anyway, it's resetting it without having to use an outside variable. So this is a temporary variable that we're setting within this function. Whenever you set these temporary variables, they're only good for as long as you're inside of those curly brackets. If I tried to use those variables outside, I couldn't, okay? They're, they're not accessible, but they're useful for doing something simple like this. Now we can also um, use just the transform variable on its own. Okay, so if I click on cube one, we've got a transform that contains position, rotation, and scale. And what we've just done is separated them out into their own individual variables so that we can capture a vector three, a quaternion, and another vector three. Okay, but we can actually capture them all in one go just using the transform variable. So let's have a go at doing that. So uh, if I type public or type transform, I'll call this something like uh, cube data, let's call it. And we don't have to initialize this one. We don't have to do anything in the start. It will automatically do this for us when we use the transform. So if I save, wait for that to update. Now you'll see we've got a new slot and it's looking for a transform. Remember, this is a game object, so it's only going to access the game object. This one being the transform is telling us it's only going to extract that transform from a game object. So now I can drag cube directly into there and it's going to get its transform. Let's do the same on the other objects. So now we can drag cube one into there and it's going to get its transform. Okay, um, so it's going to work in exactly the same way as what we've done previously, but it just makes it a little bit easier. It means we've got less um, typing to do in a way. Um, so if I come down here and I say if input dot get mouse button down, this time I'll use number two, which is the roller in the middle of the mouse. Once again, I have to do something very similar to this. Okay, so I'm going to say this dot game object dot transform dot position is going to equal uh, the cube data dot position. Okay, so it's going to get it directly from there. Now, if I just copy, paste, and paste, so this time I want rotation. It's going to get this from the rotation and then local scale. And it's going to retrieve it from the local scale. So pretty much the same as this. The main difference is that we're capturing it all from a single variable as opposed to three different variables. So if I now save this, and I press play. So first of all, this big one's gonna disappear. Then if I click the uh, middle mouse button, obviously it's gonna assume that same position. So it's doing pretty much the same thing that we did last time, but this time just using that single variable as opposed to having to define all of those vector threes. So as you can see with scripts, you can actually achieve 
the same thing in multiple ways. Okay, and that's something that we're gonna see again and again as we're scripting. Now, one of the great things about using the uh, transform is we can manipulate its position. Okay, so at the moment, we've seen that we can actually make an object jump to another position. All right, but we don't actually see it move, almost like a teleport. Okay, so we've seen how we can do that. But this time I wanna show you a linear interpolation, which is also called a lerp. This is where the object can slide from its current position to a second position. So we can get this cube to move from here over to this position. Now, in order to make this more apparent, I'm actually gonna move the two objects a little bit further apart. Okay, so that we can definitely observe that. Uh, now, if we go into our code, so I'm just going to get rid of all of this. Um, so what we can say is this dot transform dot position, and we're going to say it's equal to a vector three, and we get all sorts of options. One of which is lerp. Okay, so lerp linearly interpolates between two points, between point A and point B, using a factor of t or time. Okay, so lerp, so I'll open this. I want to say that the initial position is our own, so this dot transform dot position. The second position we want to move to is cube data dot position. And let's say we move pretty slowly around 0 0.2 f and we're going to multiply that by time dot delta time so that we're not using frame rate because that will be way way too fast okay so that's how you do a lerp uh, now at the moment i'm using get button down all right which means it will only move once because it operates on one frame so if i press play and I just try and use the middle mouse button, you'll notice they are very slowly moving toward each other if I keep clicking that. Now, if we change this to just get button on its own without the down, so it's gonna operate very much like an update, it's gonna be running every frame. Now we should see them smoothly move toward each other. So let's try it again. There we go, and so now they will basically slide toward each other. Notice that they slow down as they approach each other. So you get this kind of easing as they approach each other, which is a nice element of a lerp. All right, so if you know exactly where you want one object to move from, and you know exactly where you want it to move to, a lerp is actually a great way that you can achieve that. And I've obviously hard-coded this value, 0 0.2 but if I turn that once again into some kind of a variable and it's going to be a float variable so let's say public float uh, let's call it um, let's call it lerp speed let's maybe double it so 0 0.4 f okay and I save that I will now have that option inside of Unity's uh, inspector. So lerp speed for cube one, which one's you, cube one? That's the small one. So yeah, let's keep that at 0 0.4. And let's say for this larger one, I want it to move even faster. So let's make that 0 0.6. Let's see the result. In fact, actually, I've done that, but I haven't, I haven't placed this variable in the script. I've still got my 0 0.2f. So let's change that to lerp speed. There we go. Now it's actually using the variable. Okay, so let's try it now. And there we go. So we can see one object is moving faster than the other, and we now have control over how quickly that is moving. Now, in Unity, there are usually multiple ways that you can achieve the same thing in script. 
So we've got them. We've got two different types of movements at the moment. We've got kind of a teleport where it can jump to the other position. Uh, we've also got a lerp where it can slide toward the other position. But we also have a translate. This is where it takes the position and it moves it based on an input. Like for example, maybe you're pressing right or you're pressing left or you're pressing A or D on your keyboard, like it, as in the WASD, and you can then move that object based on the speed. This is the most common way to actually move an object. Uh, so we're going to do that now. Um, so let's get rid of this loop. So to do this, we're going to say this dot transform dot and this time, instead of saying position, we're going to say translate, which basically means move. And then we're going to open our bracket. So it expects some kind of a vector three translation, which is obviously just the X, Y, and Z. And let's take a look inside of Unity. So if we take a look at this object, we can see the red is the X axis. So if we move on the X axis, we're going to move left and right. Z-axis is going to move us back and forward. Y-axis is going to move us up and down. So let's move left and right. So on the red axis, which is obviously this one, this is the uh, X. And let's also move it based on what we've just put in there. We've put in our lerp speed. So we can actually use that. That's fine. Lerp speed. And we're going to multiply it by time dot delta time just to make sure it's not too fast and it's the same speed on all computers. Let's save that. So we'll do a get mouse button down too, which is fine. And we should see both of them move actually. So if I click this, so you'll notice it's actually moving. As soon as I release it, it stops, start moving again. So if I click on this, now they're moving extremely slowly. So let's get them to move a bit faster, let's say around 1.5 for this cube and around 1.8 for this cube. Let's try it again. There we go, that's a lot faster. So now they're basically moving. Okay, that's good. Um, we can actually reverse the way in which it's moving simply by putting a minus before this one. So that will force it to go the other way now. So let's try that. There we go. Now it's moving the other way. Uh, we can also move in multiple axes at the same time. So let's in fact take this value copy it and also put it into the Z as well. So what we should end up with is a diagonal movement. So it's going to move both left and it should move backward as well because we've got that minus there on the lerp speed. Oh, it's actually moving forward, but it is moving diagonally. So let's uh, remove this minus on, on the z-axis so that it moves backward. Let's save that. So why was it moving forward? Well, because the positive is the way in which this arrow is facing. So the positive is back, the negative is forward. Okay, let's try it again. Now it's moving backwards diagonally as they're moving left as well. All right, excellent. So we're moving in two axes at the same time. We can, of course, also move in three axes. All right, so if we also paste this into here. Now, remember, we've got a minus on that. So that's the positive. Minus would force it to go down. So I actually want it to move up. So I'll just get rid of that minus on the Y. So now the X is lerp speed, the Y is lerp speed, and the Z is also lerp speed. So we'll be moving in all three axes. So let's try it now. There we go. And so it's going to move diagonally up into the sky. Excellent. Now, if we just wanted to move in one uh, direction, let's say we only wanted to move it in the X, we could type 
you know what we've just done there which is zero 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 or there's a shortcut to this we could simply say vector three dot okay and we get all sorts of stuff so for example if we just wanted to move in the z we've got back okay which is a shorthand for writing zero on the x zero on the y and the minus one on the z we should also have forward which is the positive so that will be zero zero one let's find forward so if you click on this one yep zero zero one then we've got uh, right and left so if it's left it's going to be the shortcut for writing minus one zero zero and then if we find the right that's going to be one zero zero and then we should also have up and down as well so let's find down that's going to be on the y and then up is going to be zero one zero we even have zero which is basically zero 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 and all three okay so what we want is for it to move toward the right so let's just type right and then multiply that by time dot delta time at the moment this is simply going to move one unit at the moment so i don't think it's going to move very fast but i'm not sure let's find out yeah just at a standard kind of rate okay uh, however we do have our uh, variable called lerp speed so we could actually multiply the right by lerp speed and multiply that by time dot delta time so we can actually amend that but remember you're multiplying one so you can't multiply zero remember that's not gonna that's not gonna work it's gonna return an error but you can multiply anything above zero like 0 0.1 but at the moment we're multiplying this by one all right which is going to give us the same value anyway 0 0.4 or whatever's in there because obviously when you multiply by one you get the same value if you multiply anything by 0 0.5 or something it's actually going to divide it's not going to multiply you multiply anything a greater than one such as 1.5 2 etc then you're increasing the number so we should get the same results as we had before yep so a little bit faster than the default okay um we could go even further we could actually multiply this by two and then multiply by lerp speed so you you can keep adding to this calculation if you wanted you would then get double speed instead of actually just uh, manipulating the lerp speed but obviously at that point i'm adding hard-coded values so it will always be double speed all right but you know uh, experiment try out different kind of calculations uh, we could for example multiply by lerp speed and then divide that by two and multiply by time, time that delta time so you can experiment with your math in order to get different things so now i'm effectively going to have slowed this down so now it's gone back to its kind of default what it started at which was about roughly about one okay um so you can use your vector three right left up down okay uh, but that's just basically the shorthand for writing one zero zero you will only do that when you actually want to move only in the one axis all right but it is a way for us to do our transform translate now let's say that we wanted to be able to move both left and right by using an input get axis so let's say get axis uh, horizontal and we want to check if it's greater than zero that means that we're moving to the right so uh, let's keep that lerp speed in there and then let's take all of this control and c control and v if we're now moving to the left then we can change this to vector three dot left okay so now we have control over our objects let's save that
Now it's not going to work with our middle mouse button. Now we need to press our arrow keys left and right, or we can press A and D. So if I go right, it goes right. If I go left, it goes left. Notice that when I release my key, it still keeps moving just for a little bit. Slight bit of speed. That's because the actual item has the speed of the input, the axis. And it takes the axis just a little bit of time to return back to zero. So if I go to Edit and Project Settings and check the Input Manager, on the horizontal, we'll notice that we've got gravity on this of about three. So that causes the actual um, number to go from something greater than zero back to zero over a set amount of time. I don't think it's three seconds, but that's just a, a modifier that causes that um, axis to be greater than zero over a set amount of time. If you didn't want that, you would set your gravity to zero and then it would basically, it would very much snap between zero and one, etc. Or, as we remember from before, we could do get axis raw, okay, which will also snap as well. So let's try that, get axis raw. So now when I move right and then stop, it instantly stops. There's no slide, okay? Because I'm obviously snapping those values. All right, excellent. So that's the basics of the transform. In the next video, we're gonna start looking at some of these components.